Hey, everybody. How you doing? It's Wednesday. It's time for the hangup. And let me tell you, uh, it's been a, a weird couple of days, but we're trying to we're trying a little bit of an experiment here. It should all work wonderfully. You guys should hear me with no problem. We have callers lined up. Uh, we are actually producing the show from the room down the hall so that maybe we can get more work done without killing our main producer, Jimmy, who currently is cosplaying as me anyway, so it's already extra confusing around here. I hope you're all doing well. I don't have um, a regular hang-up in this case because last night I did a debate, and it was on a tiny channel. Um, there's a link I shared through my Patreon, and you guys can go watch it. Um, I debated a Muslim apologist on whether or not God exists, and to his credit, he filled in with just a couple days' notice after the other Muslim apologist that I was going to debate got COVID. And so I hope he recovers. Uh, this guy stepped in. It was, um, I, I, that can be difficult, but it, it's clear that he had uh, a mission and a plan and arguments. And so we ended up um, talking a lot about beavers. And I, I'll save you some time. I'm still going to do a debate review on my Patreon. But in a nutshell, the crux of his argument is animals do things. They seem to have knowledge, and they seem to require knowledge and information. They may or may not require this information to breathe because their body's designed to breathe. It's not clear whether or not they require information to suckle but when it comes to building a dam, if you're a beaver or a nest, if you're a bird or any of those things, they must have been given information because knowledge comes from mind. Therefore, that information came from God. Now, there's mountains and mountains of problems with this, and I, I look forward to going through many of them on my debate review. But tonight's guest um, is Forrest Valkai, who you guys know from all the other shows uh, here as well as Kept Talk on Mondays and other things. Um, and I figured it would be fun. We do have callers, and we are going to get to callers quickly, but I thought it'd be fun to bring Forrest in and talk a little bit about what science has to say about a distinction between instinct, about whether or not is there such a thing as genetic memory. We've seen uh, examples with, um, you know, rats and other animals where they seem to develop a memory for smells if their parents have a memory for smell. Um, how much of genetic memory is BS? What's the limitation of instinct? Uh, and, and is it just a made up word that covers stuff we don't know, or do we have some understanding of the mechanisms and force may or may not know, but please join me welcoming, uh, Forrest Valkyrie. Hi. Uh, yeah, no, I, I, I learned about this when I joined this call. So I'll do my best to try to fill in whatever gaps I can. Um, yeah, so there, there's a few things there. Um, first of all, when you just talk about like instinctual behavior and whatever like that, um, that's that's really what we're going for. Is that a lot of times when people talk about instinct, they tend to only talk about like big, crazy, flamboyant behaviors, things like dam building. That's like a really big thing. But at the end of the day, breathing is a thing that you are doing. Like, yeah, your body does it for you. It's 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 a non uh, you know it's it's not a voluntary, voluntary action most of the time. Yeah, yeah, but like. Even still, it is it is something, it is a behavior, it's an action that you're taking. And so it's kind of weird on where you choose to draw that line on like at what point is something involuntary versus something that like this animal is doing it on purpose, but they don't really have a choice to because it's something that is kind of like, programmed into them I, I hate to use that word because i know there's some creations yeah, like really well, who's the programmer then right but like there's a yeah there, there's a weird line that you have to draw there um and so when we come to things that we definitely agree on as being instinctual be it like um you know a, a predator avoidance dam building um uh you know habitat construction whatever it may be um you come up to this idea there's a few different ways that this is explained and my favorite is it's called the baldwin effect um in layman's terms if you have some sort of uh, way to learn a thing like we see in in chimpanzees just like in humans generational learning is that you know i'm gonna you know fish for termites for for extra food but you can't just take any old random stick and do it you have to find the right kind of stick that has to be the right right length and the right flexibility and you have to strip the leaves off and so there's steps and steps here 
um, that you're creating a tool and you see chimpanzee parents teaching their babies like, okay, now do it this way. No, that's not going to work. Throw that away. Do it this way instead. Um, and so you have this behavior that has a survival advantage that is adaptive. Um, that isn't something that just comes naturally, so to speak. However, there is a genetic disposition to learning. You know, there are people, you know, the, you don't want to buy into the bullshit of like, you're, you know, genetically stupid, but like being able to learn certain things, there, there are, you know, genetic links there and different things have different, you know, qualities, different, different alleles would code for that. So you can't just be, you know, genetically predisposed to be smart, period. You would be better at this kind of learning. Maybe, maybe uh, uh, you know, you're better, you know, some sort of sport, better at some sort of music, better at some sort of science, better at some sort of whatever. Um, what people call talents are just you, you're naturally predisposed to learning this kind of thing. And so the Baldwin effect plays with this idea that if you had, you know, this offspring, this, the, you know, you, you had your, your, your child here that was predisposed to learning the thing that you're teaching them, that gives them a survival advantage, then they would also have offspring that are predisposed to learning this thing. And the ones that had the best predisposition to learning and learn the fastest would have a survival advantage and have more offspring. And so you now play this super simple neo-Darwinian idea of just like, ah, they had the advantage, they had more offspring, they had the offspring had the advantage, then they had more offspring, blah, blah, blah. Until what you're seeing is they're learning this thing faster and faster until you get to a point where you don't even recognize it, that they're learning it. They just do it. I, yeah. And so I, I pointed like, out, there's a number of things that I pointed out, not the least of which is that, you know, we, we're talking about millions upon millions of years of evolution with the ones that the birds that don't build a nest don't tend to have offspring that are going to, to live. And the ones that are successful nest yeah. builders are going to be passing that on. Um, there was a lot of confusion about what sort of things could be innate in, in a brain. And, and he kept going on about um, how knowledge was required and knowledge must come from mind and that this is information. And I kept looking at this notion and I'm like, it doesn't have to come from some other mind. The beaver that is doing this, now he mentioned a, a study where they took beavers away from their parents at birth and they still knew how to build a dam and they would start building a dam, you know, just around the water. And I'm like, yeah, I don't find that all that surprising. I find it impressive. Don't get me wrong. I find all of this impressive. The, the sort of innate uh, habits and, and uh, patterns that animals follow is impressive. But I don't find it all that surprising um, given how we recognize what all animals can do. And so mm -hmm. I think we, uh, first of all, we see a lot of this. He was an engineer. And, and one of the points I made is that people who spend a lot of time studying engineering, once you have that hammer, everything becomes a nail. And so when you look at a beaver building a dam, you're like, oh, he has knowledge. He has information of structure and tensile strength and, you know, all these other things yeah. without recognizing. I, I have specific responses to all of this for the debate review video, but I'm wondering if you, if you're aware of anything, uh, I saw a, a study where, um, Rats were uh, separated, and one of them was introduced to a smell, and then the babies of the ones that had the smell uh, had the same yeah. aversion to the smell, while the babies of the other one didn't. Now that yeah. suggests that there's something um, like an an ability to pass on genetically a learned thing. And granted, yeah. I don't have any more information than that. I just didn't know if you. Uh, I had looked into that type so, of stuff at all. Yeah. Genetic memory or like uh, uh, the, the inheritance of memory, so to speak, um, is something that I'm not super duper well versed in. It's just not not my area of expertise. But I could say that there's a couple parts of it that like, number one, there are some misconceptions where people think that like it's actually like a literal memory being passed down when what it's more likely is, is you know, some sort of epigenetic change. So, for example... Um, epigenetics are changes not to the genome itself, but to the way that the genome is expressed. Um, and so like with sticking with rats, um, rats that have really good rat moms that lick their pups all over and like soothe them and love on them have lower cortisol levels, lower stress hormones levels. And then they end up having babies that they also lick and love on and whatnot. And rats that have shitty rat moms that the moms don't take care of them very well, don't lick them. They have higher stress hormone levels. 
and it causes an actual genetic change in them, an epigenetic change, and they do not take care of their children very well either. And to prove that it was an epigenetic change and not a behavioral change, to show that this behavior is now being encoded into their DNA in this way, um, they did a million experiments. Number one, they took babies from a good parent and a bad parent and swapped them. And the ones that didn't get licked upon also didn't lick their shit. And they're like, okay, well, it could still be a learned behavior, though. They literally put freaking electrodes in these things' brains and, like, manipulated them in such a way to prove that to completely erase behavior from the equation. And there was still this, this inherited uh, uh, sequencing there. So, like, there are things like that, which you could call a memory type situation where you're encoding a behavior that you learned from a parent or even one that happened beforehand. Um, Beyond that, uh, and that can also go into predator avoidance, smell aversion, things like this, Uh, especially talking about rats. One of the reasons why they're weird is because rats have this thing that we call the rhinocephalon, which literally means nose brain. Like 80% of their brain is nose. Um, It's just focused on uh, olfaction. Um, And so like something as powerful as smell for a rat definitely could have these big effects. But even if you take all that out of it, like you talk about like behavior, Um, you know, bacteria have behavior, a response to stimuli that's outside of the normal day-to-day life of bacteria. There are lots of species of bacteria, for example, um, this is a really cool study in altruism as well, um, that like the bacteria is growing on then they're, they're spreading out in their environment. And then there's a new species of bacteria over here. There's another kind over here that's a competitor. And so that when they meet, this bacteria will produce a toxin that kills all the other species of bacteria, but that is harmless to its species. And in so doing that, it also kills itself. It produces so much of this stuff that its body doesn't do anything else and it breaks down. And so it produces this poison that kills all the other bacteria around it, except for its species, so its species can now grow into this new area. So this is a response to stimuli that leads to suicide that is beneficial to the population, beneficial to the species, and also as happening in something that doesn't even have a brain to think about what it's doing. And so like this, and, and fun fact also, one of those bacteria, I can't remember, it's, it sounds like pneumonia the name does, but like there's a, a bacteria that is so good at doing that, that like it's being studied as like a treatment potentially for pneumonia because it like it kills other bacteria in the lungs that it doesn't hurt the person. <laughs> Wild shit. Anyway. But um, uh, yeah, the whole point is like we see in all sorts of organisms, e- even ones that can't think, um, uh, response to stimuli, behavioral evolution, um, and it always comes down to the same thing that any other neo-Darwinian you know thing would be. It's better for the population this way, and so this is the trend that we right. see. Because it's not selecting. Um, individuals aren't necessarily being selected for. Um, the only thing that matters is the genes in the population and the trends over time. And so yeah. if, yeah, if th- that I find interesting. I also, also love the fact that, I mean, I spent a lot of time with rats. Uh, and as a matter of fact, I had one, two, three, three more brand new rat moms today um, mm-hmm. in, in my maternity rack down there. Um, so we have rats of all different sizes. And we have witnessed um, the shitty rat moms that you talked about. Uh, yep. in uh, firsthand, there are some we've watched what would be a good rat mom take an action that's appalling to us, which is if there are two pregnant moms, one of them has babies and this one is still pregnant. Mm-hmm. In, in some cases, the one that is still pregnant will eat the other mom's babies. And we suspected that this was done to make sure that the limited resources were available for her own kids oh. in the same way that that yeah. factory would, would do that. So there's been, you know, an unfortunate amount of some moms have basically eaten their own young. Uh, Some of those others have eaten uh, the young of others, which is why now instead of doing any sort of like colony setup, we've moved to uh, moving pregnant moms to a maternity tub so they get a place by themselves. Because the one thing we have on very rare occasions, we've witnessed a rat mom eating its own young um, and those are the ones that we just cull from from the breeding entirely because we don't want those traits yeah. being passed on. We we really well, like the ones that are friendly and yeah, we really like the ones that are friendly and pleasant um, and take care of their young. 
That, those are good traits to pass. Easiest on. to kill. That makes sense. <laughs> but, yeah, so they, but yeah, no, lots, lots, and lots of animals will eat their own young whenever resources are sparse. And rats and mice, in particular, they have this other really cool thing called the Bruce effect, um, where they can actually self-induce abortion. Um, if if you have a, a, a pregnant rat or mouse and a new male comes into the population, they will automatically they'll they'll have an abortion by themselves. They'll terminate their own pregnancy so as not to have babies that this new male is probably going to kill so that he can have right. his own babies and waste those resources. Um, and so like they self terminate so that they can now breed with this other dude. It's super cool stuff, dude. And like, that's, that's the thing. It really always comes down to resource management. It always comes down to resource management. Um, and uh, it, it's weird how brutal it can be when you really frame things that way. Um, but also you can learn a lot of cool stuff. Not only can you learn cool stuff about rats, but also like, hey, here we are with world hunger and orphanages all over the place. Maybe we could learn a thing or two. You know what I mean? I'm just saying, we have options, you know? <laughs> you, sh you should take the weekend off and join us in Arlington because we're going to be at NARBC uh, doing a bunch of stuff. And then after that, you can come down to Austin and you can look at my rat breeding experiments. But uh, hey, so I, uh, I want to start taking calls if you're ready. I'm down. I'm down. And uh, because there was a call, call in and be like, are you serious about his Jonathan Swift reference? Yeah. Uh, I want to take this one first because I saw it come in before the show even started. We have Anna in Eastern Europe, um, who's a theist. And how are you? Is it Anna or Anna? Anna. Hello. Anna. Awesome. Welcome. Can you hear me all right? We hear you just fine. Um, how are you and how can we help? I'm stuck uh, in my deconstruction, but um, it's um, my position is a bit different. I wasn't really raised theist. Um, in my upbringing, religion really didn't feature much. Um, not that I was raised directly atheist, but religion was something that other people did or had. Uh, but I was curious about the topic. I explored a lot um, from the quote-unquote real religions like uh, Christianity, Islam, and so on, to the more um, alternative New Age, pagan, and so on religions. Uh, but now I'm stuck with a belief I can shake. Uh, and the funny part is that I didn't really realize that I was seized until I started watching your shows. Uh, and Forrest, uh, I remember one uh, of your shows. Um, I, w I won't be able to really quote you, but you said that you don't believe in God, but if there was one, uh, it is an evil God, and you were willing to fight against it. And that's when it hit me. I wouldn't be able to say that without being afraid. And it made me realize that on some low level in the back of my mind, I still believe in a deity that can uh, make my life miserable if I'm not a good girl. Does this make any sense to you? Yes, absolutely yes. So now I'm wondering yeah. how, how to shake that uh, voice in the back of my mind. Sure. Uh, I'm afraid to stop believing. I'm f afraid to stop obeying these rules, which I can't even really point out. Um, well, the, the question is, which God are you most afraid of? For example, are you more afraid of um, the God of Christianity or the God of Islam? It's a bit of a mess because I picked up a bit from all directions. Um, I believe in an anthropomorphic entity, which is not quite supernatural, but possesses the knowledge uh, which makes it indistinguishable from a supernatural being. Sure. Um, but if you so, it has the well, uh, the well, temperament well, of the Old Testament God, uh, but um, I never believed neither in heaven or in hell. I just believe that we're stuck in this plane, uh, and this Old Testament bully can make our life miserable if we don't obey. 
Except we have no evidence that that being exists. We have no evidence that it's actually doing that. And so the question is, figure out which God you're afraid of. And then how do you, how are, how do you know what you are supposed to do to avoid the wrath of that God? I have absolutely no reason to believe in a God like this. I'm aware of it. But on the emotional level, the fear is still there. And that so, is so what, what I'm asking is, if you assume that the God exi- that you're afraid of exists, how do you know mm-hmm. what you are or are, should or should not do to keep this God happy, to keep it from punishing you? Um... I'm sorry, uh, I'm having problems formulating this end, uh, answer. I'm not a native speaker. Um, That's fine. Basically, I have a tendency to try to find the, the meaning to the bad things that happen in my life. I'm not really able to write them off as co- coincidence of the integral part of every life. So, um, in trying to find a reason, but, but the, I tend to go back to this God. Sure. Well, Here's okay. the thing. Can, sorry. Go ahead, Forrest. Well, I was going to say, I think, I think what you know, Matt's saying and what, what might help to understand is, is like, there's this old quote by Bertrand Russell uh, that said that based on the sheer number of religions out there and all the different you know, iterations and interpretations and all the different uh, uh, denominations of, of every religion, even if we could all be sure that one of them was right, every single person should expect damnation just as a matter of probability. Even if you believe in one of them, <laughs> based on the sheer number of them and all the ones that disagree with each other, you're probably going to hell anyway. So, you know, you, you are surely, you've been brought up to be afraid of this God, of this religion that you have. And that's totally reasonable. Lots and lots of people have been. There's no shame in that. But ask yourself, how afraid are you of all of these other ideas out there? How worried are you about Sekhmet, the crocodilian-headed god of Egypt, and offending him? <laughs> and also, how can you be sure that even in the religion that you were brought up in, even with the rules that you were taught, how can you be sure that those are the right ones? You can't. And so at the end of the day, you either need nope. to be afraid of everything or decide if this god does exist, then, and if, and if it is a good person, if, or a good whatever it is, then it should be able to tolerate being questioned a little bit. And if it can't, then fuck that guy anyway. You know what I mean? Yeah. When you said <laughs> when you said you didn't ever believe okay. in heaven or hell, I didn't go down the normal route, which is, you know, hey, if the goal mm-hmm. is to seek an afterlife, you know, which heaven should you seek? Should you seek the best heaven or should you seek to avoid the worst hell? And what if in the process of avoid, avoiding the worst hell, you land in the second worst hell or the third worst hell? Or if you're seeking the second or third or fourth best uh, heaven, it turns out that uh, the f- fifth or first or eighth best heaven is the right one, but because you believed in a different one, you're punished. So the, the, I just skipped all that. And I, the question is, mm-hmm. it, if you assume that the God you're afraid of is real, how do you find out what you are and aren't supposed to do in order to earn that God's uh, favor, in order to avoid the thing that you're fearful of? Uh, and if you don't have a mechanism, if you don't have some way to say, oh, here's how I know what I should and shouldn't do, then whether or not you can stop yourself from believing it, and I don't think that you can, belief isn't a choice. I'm not convinced whether or not you actually believe so much as whether or not you're willing to act as if you believe uh, out of fear. But at the end of the day, whether or not you, can, you are convinced that there is a God, if you're not convinced that you have a good course of action, if you're not convinced that you have some way of knowing what you should do, then I would argue that the best, way to do, best thing to do is to live your life as if you didn't believe in a God. That way, if there is a real God and he comes up to you and says, why are you worried about this other God? Why weren't you worshiping me? You can say, I would love to if you had explained any of this to me or told me what I needed to do. Oh, wow. I really like this argument. <laughs> um, it's almost something a lawyer would say. 
I've, I've been accused of that <laughs> once or twice. So, in essence, it, it's about um, daring to do something without being sure of the consequences. Yeah, a little bit. And, and that's the thing is, is like, like you, you mentioned at the beginning of the call, as I've said a lot of times, even if this God was real, I would still be against it. Because this idea that if you don't believe in me and you don't worship me and you don't love me, I'm going to hurt you is awful. And if you add on yeah, the is. idea that I'm also not going to give you any good reason to believe in me and worship me and love me, but you still better do it, it's, it's, it's evil and it's kind of dumb. And so even if this was real, yeah, it's, it's, it is a very scary proposition. You, you were taught a, about a boogeyman in your closet that was used to scare children, and then they never told you it wasn't a real thing. And like I said, there's, there's no shame in that. It, it happens to all of the, a lot of people. Um, but just put it in your own words. You know, ask ask yourself if a human being gave you this exact same situation, what would you do with it? Take your God out of the equation because a lot of times people like to, they, they even if they don't realize they're doing it, they'll give special rules and special permissions to a God. Take that out. If I told you, hey, you better love me and if you don't, I'll freaking murder you. And and you've never met me before. And you have no idea who I am. Or if you, if some random dude on the street said this to you, how would you handle it? Would you go on believing this and, and doing these things? Or would you say, fuck you, I don't need to do any of this? Um, I, I would take precautions. Probably have the police involved really quickly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. And unfortunately, you can't call the cops on God. So, like, the best thing you can yeah. do is just say, "Screw it, I'm, I'm, I'm not interested." Okay. Um, thanks to both of you, you have given me something to think about. But um, awesome. I think I will be calling you again. Um, okay. So, thank you. Really. Thanks, Anna. Thank you, Anna. Super nice lady. By the way, somebody pointed out in the chat that uh, uh, it was Sobek was the crocodile-headed god and Sekhmet was the lion-headed god. Uh, thank you very much for correcting me. Y'all have too much time on your hands. Well, I no, think Marta, no, some of it might be seriously. because a lot of people watched Moon Knight. Oh, is that a big part of it? If you haven't seen Moon Knight, it's one of the best of the, of the uh, Marvel Disney Plus series. But yes, there's references to those in there. That cool very cool we have a call specifically calling in for you oh snap yeah uh people thulu bruce Hello, from, Sid from sydney pronouns he him uh has a question for forrest so i will uh, back my ass up i'll do my best I, I see what the call is about and i don't know how good i'll be at this but i'll, I'll do my best cool hello hello how are you Oh, good. You can hear me. Um, so I was watching yes. someone else's YouTube channel, and they mentioned about trilobites being their shells being made out of silicon. Okay. Is that kind of true? That's true? I'll double check. Oh, I'll double cool. check. Sorry, I didn't know. Because I know, like, most other bugs, their shells are made out of keratin. Chitin. Chitin. Sorry. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so trilobites, uh, no, their shells are made of chitin. There are uh, uh, creatures out there like uh, diatoms, for example. Diatoms have silicone shells. Uh, silicon, pardon me. Yep. Um, yeah, they, they have silicon shells. Um, diatoms are microorganisms. They're a, a phytoplankton. They're, they're photosynthetic microorganisms, little sing single-celled creatures. Um, and they make shells out of silicon, so they're literally surrounded in glass. They have a really complicated uh, way of dividing. They do binary fission like bacteria do. Um, because they have to literally build a new glass shell. It's super cool stuff. They're beautiful to look at under a microscope too. But no, trilobites are definitely chitin. I just double checked. Um, fun oh. fact about chitin, by the way. Chitin is what all arthropod shells are made out of. Uh, all ar arachnids, uh, uh, insects, uh, crustaceans, everything. Um, and chitin is also the chemical that makes the cell walls of mushrooms. So anytime you eat mushrooms on your pizza, you're literally eating cockroach shells and shit. How cool is that? Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, rambled for a minute there, but it's just, it's a cool chemical. I love it. Right. So what's our fingernails made out of then? 
That's carrot. Yeah. Your fingernails and your hair and the, the chemical that makes your skin waterproof, that is keratin. Um, uh, don't and chew your nails. is what makes... Sorry? I was going to say, don't chew your nails because you're eating cockroach bits. Or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's... Yeah, chewing your nails isn't the same as cockroaches because cockroaches are chitin. So, cock, uh, so uh, uh, arthropod shells uh, and mushrooms are chitin. Um, hair and fingernails are keratin. Um, so is rhinoceros horn and all that other stuff. It's all keratin. Um, uh, and, uh, that's also produced in a really weird way. You have these things called keratinocytes that cornify, meaning they fill up with this keratin until they die and then lay up these horrible little scales. Um, it's really gross to think about, but it's a lot of fun. I can see another, uh, YouTube short coming with that then. <laughs> Maybe, yeah, no, that would be a good episode of Cursed Biology for sure. <laughs> okay, thanks very much. Hey, thank Cheers. you. I hope that helps. It did. Toodle. There we go. Cheers, man. All right, and continuing sure on. All of those are polysaccharides. Let me double check. No, keratin's a protein, isn't it? Is chitin a polysaccharide? See, and, me, and now I don't know what to say. But I, I while it you're is. looking it up, I went on to another caller, Nikki at San Jose. Um, this will be fun because I don't Jose, know if we agree. You need to know I, that chitin. Sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was going to tell Nikki in San Jose that chitin is the second most abundant polysaccharide on the planet after cellulose. Cellulose is what makes the cell walls of plants. That's awesome. I didn't know that. I learned a thing today. It's a good day. Hello, Nikki. Uh, yes, I'm here. All right. Well, how can we help? Welcome to the show. You're on the line. Hey, uh, yeah. Thank you for having me. I'm a, a big fan of both you guys and the show. Uh, I did have a question specifically for Forrest, but Matt, if you'd like to give your opinion as well, it's more than welcome. Um, mm -hmm. So, Forrest, I, I think you mentioned like uh, in the prior video when either like a like a religious person says bless you to like a non-religious person that it can have either some sort of like negative or harmful effect i don't know if, mm. if you were like referring to just the fact that it's you know perpetuating you know religious ideology or if there was like a deeper meaning to that i just wanted to jog your memory and yeah, get your the, uh, your thoughts on that you, on, you commented yeah. on wasn't it on youtube wasn't it yes that was me Perfect. Awesome. Thanks so much for calling in. I really appreciate it because I did not want to type all this out. Um, yeah. So I, the way, the reason why I say this is it's not just the words bless you really. It's, it's mainly like when people say God loves you or Jesus loves you or something like that, especially as a way to end an argument. It's really annoying. Um, but yeah, when people say things like uh, Jesus loves you or bless you or anything like that, um, I do take issue with it and I don't make a big fuss about it because the big thing is they think that they are being really polite and nice and welcoming and generous. What's nicer than telling somebody that they're loved? You know, that makes total sense. Uh, they see this as a very inclusive and loving thing. I see it as a very hurtful and cruel thing to say to somebody because when you look at the whole dogma, the whole idea of this religion, it's that humans are born sinful. We are born evil. We are born broken and sick and wicked. And we need this love of this God to be saved from our sinful nature. And the alternative is we burn in hell for all eternity. Um, and this is all the perfect design of this God. This is the justice of this God. We all deserve hell. We deserve to be burned forever. Um, and, and that's actually the best thing they can have. That would be the most moral good thing to happen to us is if we burn forever. But by God's mercy and grace, we are saved from this torment that we deserve so wholeheartedly. And so when you tell me God loves me, when you tell me God bless you, when you tell me things like that, what I'm hearing is, is you're saying the first half of the statement, which is God loves you so much that he'll torture you forever if you don't love him back. It's, it's an insult and it's a threat. You're telling me you are so evil and disgusting and terrible. The best thing in the world would be that if you were just tortured forever. 
but good for you. Here's this love that you should know about. Um, it's it's an insult and it's a threat and it's a twisted mockery of what love is. Um, I love my wife. I don't care what she does. It, it, if she doesn't like me back, I'm never going to set her on fire in my garage. That's fucked up. That's a sick mockery of love. So for this God to say, I love you so much that I will torture you forever if you don't love me back. That's a stalker. That's not a loving deity. <laughs> and I think it's really gross that people would use that as a form of, of, of a, a nice gesture. So that's, that's why I say, saying God loves you, Jesus loves you, God bless you, things like that. It, I understand that they think they're being nice, so I don't usually raise a stink about it. But I hear it as a threat, an insult, a, a twisted uh, a charlatan's mockery of love and a, a, a defamation of everything that love is. And I don't, I don't think that's really appropriate. That's my answer. And, and I recently did an, a video <clears throat> because um, Michael Jones, who tweets his uh, inspiring philosophy, tweeted, um, Jesus loves all transgender people. Mm. And I, I found that you, know, you can go watch the video, but to, to do the short version of it, um, there's a huge problem with saying stuff like that. It's like Jesus even loves trans people because Jesus loves everyone. And so you could have just said Jesus loves everyone because that's doctrinally the position. But when you say Jesus loves trans folks, it suggests even though they don't deserve it. And people will do the same thing of Jesus loves murderers. Jesus loves rapists. Jesus loves all sinners. And he also loves homosexuals he lo he just doesn't you know he's going to punish them and kill them for what they do but uh you know he loves them that sort of messaging is it, it is a demonstration of how religions have poisoned people's mind so that they cannot recognize um reasonable good proper love love that values a person for who they are love that doesn't just apply universally to everybody of course i love you i love everyone how silly would it be if on your first date um you told the person that you were on a date with i love you and when they looked at you funny you just say oh i i love everyone i just wanted you to know that and now if you ever like fall in love with them now you've got to give like a lecture on what the difference is because you've devalued it I don't love everyone. As a matter of fact, I probably despise quite a few people. Um, I love humanity as a concept and as a group. But there are people that I don't love, which means when I tell Arden I love her, when I tell Forrest I love him, when I, whoever, they know, oh, this isn't just what he says. This doesn't apply to everybody. Now there's something special about it. Now it is I'm valuing you for who you are, not as in the in the case of the video i'm valuing you despite who you are yeah i think that's that's a really good point because it, it really does it that 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 burden of the message behind it really does come to bear especially when you're talking about groups that have been historically discriminated against and marginalized by christianity if you're talking to an lgbt person if you're talking to an atheist if you're talking to, to any of these people that have been historically put down and, and 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 tortured and disenfranchised by this religion it sounds you're right it sounds an awful lot like they're making a, set, a special exception or that they're rubbing it in your face and being like yeah but hey here here's there's still this special love that goes against every other kind of love you've ever heard of or ever even thought of it's still there for you yeah it's just it's just gross it's real gross and uh, yeah, I appreciate you not making me type all this out on, on you see why I didn't want to put all this in an Instagram or a, <laughs> a, a YouTube comment or whatever. Oh yeah, definitely. No, I, uh, I appreciate uh, <laughs> both of you guys' answers. Uh, Matt, and Matt, yeah, I did, uh, I did watch that, um, that video, you know, God loves all trans people. And yeah, I, I completely agree with all of that, you know, um, awesome. uh, well, I, I appreciate, you. Uh, appreciate you guys for your time and answering my question. Thanks so much. Absolutely. Thank you. Have a good day, Nikki. All right. It is hard all right, that, with the with the God loves all trans people thing. It is really difficult because like I can I can understand the good that they were trying to do, but I it's the same thing. Like I get why you thought that was a nice thing to say. It's just you have to grapple with all this baggage now. And like I don't know. 
what sucks worse is that the the response to it probably won't be negative because of that. It'll be negative because no, he doesn't, and they're trying to like convert the people back. Oh, it's it's very strange, and 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 I'm waiting to see kind of what if anything comes out of it, um, because I think I saw a comment where where the original poster said, "Oh, I posted this kind of as an experiment," and so I'm curious. I mean, he's He's, I've debated him. He's a, he's a nice guy. We don't agree on stuff, and I'm pretty sure I told him to fuck off at some point, so maybe he doesn't like me much anymore. I don't know. <laughs> but, you know, for me, saying fuck off is not... I was in the military for eight and a half years. Um, you know, that's the shit you say uh, in in the morning to be pleasant. Uh, but <laughs> it, I, I seem to recall him saying he was doing it somewhat as an experiment, and I'm curious as to whether or not it was, let me see... Uh, how many people are commenting agreeing with this statement? How many people are commenting to pedantically point out, well, of course he does, he loves everybody, um, uh, and whether or not there are people who object to it. Uh, because I, he doesn't shy away from the fact that he, he and other Christians don't see eye to eye on some things. Um, mm. There are things that he probably agrees um, with me about, that not obviously the God thing, but other things. It's really hard uh, to figure out when somebody's like using social media uh, as a test bed to see what kind of responses I get. Um, I guess the difference between that and trolling is that in trolling, I don't think you have any interest in the actual content of the response. You're just looking for a reaction. A response, um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And in this case, maybe he's looking for an extra response. I don't know. It's, it doesn't... I... I get the idea of like testing people's responses to things. I don't like it when people do that without the prompt of saying, Hey, how does this sound? You know, Cause like to do that, you could have actually caused a lot of social harm. Like you could have hurt people by saying something like this, but you were just seeing what you'd say. And it, it, I don't know. It just seems like a cop out. I don't, I don't know. It, it's yeah. I don't follow it. There's too much. Social media is too hard to, to, to follow too many people and there's so many things i i had a friend um who i've known for years and i haven't seen in a couple of years um who's in the hospital dealing with um cancer and uh I, I reached out to him when i finally saw it but he's been dealing with it for a while but because of the way social media works it just wasn't showing me any of his stuff and so you know, he's been talking about going through chemo, going through, you know, all this. And when is he going to get time off to go home before the next round of chemotherapy and all this? And it was months of dealing, you know, with this. And I, you know, it's it's not my fault. It's not his fault. It's not even the, the algorithm's fault as to what it's showing you. But it's it's funny that it's going to keep feeding me the things that I'm clearly having an interest in. And I'm trying to make sure that on the list of things I have an interest in is what's going on with the people that I care about. Uh, <laughs> I did something interesting and that is I did a debate last night. I did not watch the state of the union. Um, I didn't watch it. I didn't watch any discussions about it. Um, I didn't watch any, I saw a couple of tweets but I mean, it's not like I didn't go watch any of the news media talking heads tell me what I should think about the state of the union or anything else. Uh, I I didn't necessarily do it as an experiment, but if I do something like that, I'm always going to try to turn it into a, into an experiment, which is to yeah. see how significant of an impact there is on me for not paying attention to something that every year for the past, you know, I don't know, 15, 20 years, I have absolutely paid attention to the state of the union. Um, Maybe I don't need the state of the union. <laughs> I think maybe maybe my life is going to be exactly the same with the news stories showing up, irrespective of who gave a speech and how many minutes of standing ovations they got during it. Mm -hmm. It's it's hard because like that's of of all of the the useless things <laughs> that come out of our government. That's it. It is just like hey, we got some stuff done. Cool. That's what we hired you for. Do more. <laughs> I guarantee it wasn't enough. Please continue. <laughs> well, we got a bunch of calls. Um, we don't have. Oh, we do have. Uh, yes. Hang on. I went ahead and put this one through because this one's going to be difficult. I have some thoughts, and then I'm also going to punt. So, uh, Pyro, pronounce they them, or is it Pyro? Pyro. 
Pyro, they them uh, in California has a question for us. So welcome. How are you? I'm all right. How are you? I, I'm all right. Day. I'm a little, t- I'm I'm tired but happy. Cool, cool. That's that's decent. That's not bad. So so what's um, the question today? So I right. Um so I'm not sure what the call screener said. Um I think he reworded it for me. Um because I'm not really sure how to like say ask the question um, just go for non, it like okay so why can't someone be transracial yeah. cool so first of all i i'd recommend that uh you you go get answers from the transatlantic call show and other people who have more of an expertise but i'll tell you what I, my thoughts are on this because um the transracial things come up for a number of years now from I think it was Rachel Dozal and a bunch of others. Um, and for me, it's pretty straightforward. Yes, race is a social construct. Gender is a social construct. But race is a social construct that isn't about um, behaviors, roles in society, or psychological um, identity. It is a social construct about physical differences only and not about the self-imposed, self-declared core of identity the way gender is. Both race and gender are social constructs, but so is the fiat money system. And you're not, you can't be trans currency and the currency you have isn't trans dollar. Um, Just because things are similar doesn't mean they're directly analogous and certainly doesn't mean that what applies to one applies to another. Now you could certainly more closely associate with a group of people of a particular race, but what you're doing in that situation is more akin to associating with a culture than what we often incorrectly label as race anyway. And we could probably as a society benefit from identifying Uh, a variety of cultures and ignoring distinctions that we want to put in as race because the differences between us culturally are significant. Those go to our identity. Those go to how we feel, how we interact. Um, The differences between us with the thing we want to label as race is uh, minuscule, if not virtually non-existent. We're just saying, oh, you have more melanin production than I do, therefore you must be of a different race. When the difference between me and someone who's darker than me is vanishingly small, whereas the cultural difference between how I speak, what I do, what my uh, thoughts are about my relationship to family or, or duties and responsibility and culture or the food that I like or the way I dress, all of those things get together that becomes a a proper identity and i I would think that maybe in in the future i hope i didn't coin a new phrase but i think you might be seeing people identifying more as transcultural um than transracial because transracial despite the fact that race is a construct race is pointing to physical characteristics that have nothing to do with your identity and that's my reason why somebody can be transgender or perhaps transcultural, but not transracial. Yeah, I would, I would expound on that just slightly and, and say uh, two things, by the way. Uh, one thing in the uh, call screen here, it says that you were asking for somebody else. It was like your mom was asking this question or something like that, and you're just passing it along. Is that right? Yeah, like um, we were okay. having an argument about transgenderism. I'm transgender. Right, right. I just want to... And I just wanted to make sure that he, I knew where yeah. the question was coming from so that nobody was harping on you for this question. I just want to make sure that we established where it was coming from. Um, also, but yeah, I would expound on that just a little bit and um, uh, point out the fact that, you know, 
as Ray said, biologically speaking, there is no such thing as race. Race is a completely social, cultural construct. It's something that was invented in order to categorize people. It has never done a very good job at categorize people, like categorizing people. And it has always led to those shitty, bad categorizations being used for shitty, bad reasons. Um, it is not functional. However, it is a, a, it has its roots in ethnicity. It's something that's rooted in more or less where you come from and, and so kind of what you look like there. Um, and there's a lot of really important things to look into in regards of race. Um, oh gosh, there's one, uh, uh, Kathleen Sterling, I think, is, is a paper that I, uh, an author that I talk about quite a bit whenever this comes up. She wrote a really good paper on, on black feminist theory and archaeology um, where she describes what whiteness is. And she points out the fact that whiteness, by definition, is the lack of anything else. You know, Barack Obama is half white and half black. Why don't we say he's white? Why do we say he's black? Because that's the concept of whiteness, is if you add in another race, you're no longer white anymore. It's this bullshit purity idea, um, which, by the way, is a big part of white supremacy. Uh, but anyway, uh, it's this, you know, the way we talk about race is so broken and so stupid um, that really it, it can't be boiled down to any one functional thing. I can't go get a tan until you call me black, right? Um, and so what we do know for sure about these, what we call racial characteristics, quote unquote, um, is number one, they vary independently of one another. So your lip shape, your eye shape, your nose shape, your hair uh, texture, your skin tone, your height, your, 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 you know, body, uh, where you deposit, you know, body fat, or like all these different things that we use as racial markers all very independently. You can have this from one race and this from another race and this from another race, all in the same person. Uh, also, they all vary on a sliding scale. The, where, the places where we draw markers on them is completely arbitrary. And what's most important is that they all have evolutionary histories behind them. So for example, talking about black and white skin, um, the first humans had black skin. Humans evolved in Africa, dark skin has uh, melanin, a lot, lot, lot uh, lots and lots of melanin in it. Um, and uh, this melanin is useful because it blocks out UV light and protects the folic acid in your blood so you don't have a baby with a spinal deformity like spina bifida. Um, meanwhile, you know, so we got dark skin so we could have healthy babies. Meanwhile, my ancestors move way up north where there isn't a lot of vitamin D in the grains and the food that you can eat. There isn't a lot of direct sunlight. If you don't have enough UV light, then you don't produce enough vitamin D and you get bone deformities like rickets. You need vitamin D for mood stabilization and also to give you healthy, strong bones. So we develop lighter skin to absorb as much vitamin D as we need. And you can play with this with pretty much anything. If you want, um, there is, oh, flip. There's a good book on this that I have laying around here somewhere. It's called Race, Are We So Different? And it's published by the American Anthropological Association. It's, it's in this room somewhere. I'll find it. But you, can, you, you can look up that uh, or you can look up um, uh, Jablin, Jablinski, Jablonski or something. Nina, Nina Jablonski. I don't know. There's, there's a million amazing you know, uh, uh, authors and scientific papers about this and really cool books about this. But that's the whole thing is that race is this thing that's this ridiculous concept that we've really used for political reasons more than anything else. Um, whereas gender is also a social construct, but it's something that is, as Matt said, just a societal role. It's a thing you do. It's a performance that you put on. Uh, the idea of gender being a performative thing is a really, really, really fun topic. You can look up in feminist archaeological theory, but like um, they, uh, uh, this idea of, of, of gender being something that you is immutable doesn't make any sense when you cross cultural lines or even generational lines. So why you can't be transracial when you can be transgender, number one, being transgender isn't a choice. It's just a thing that you are. It's a way that you, you don't identify with the box that people are trying to cram you in. That's not your fault. Um, and number two, because uh, races have ethnicities, they have cultures, they have histories, they have a lot of pain and trauma and success and beauty that you don't get to just claim. Um, that's not fair. And it's a reason why, for example, like, you know, when I say black, 
I'm speaking about African Americans. I, I, I would, you know, I could talk about black Africans as well, but like there's a difference between a black person in Africa and a black person in America, because here in America, they had their culture stripped away from them. They had their language stripped away from them. They had their religion stripped away from them. They had everything taken from them and they had to make a new culture out of whatever they had left. So you have this new ethnicity here that is disjointed from the original one. And so this is a history that you don't get to just buy into, you know? So to say transracial is, uh, it's a lot of things. There's a lot wrong with it. Um, it's conflating things that don't need to be conflated. And it's a, being very, very tone deaf and uh, uh, culturally ignorant. Um, and I could go on with this for a lot longer, but I don't think it's uh, functional or useful. Does that answer your question? Um, I think I asked the wrong question then. Um, <laughs> okay. Shit. But to, to um like <laughs> to um kind of like pinpoint what I'm saying, like um so would you say then that uh, even though it's a social construct, more um would um race be closer to how we view sex? No. 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 Um, so one of them, uh, with regard to gender, has to do with people's perceptions of themselves and each other from a psychological perspective, from the role, from the standpoint of roles that people play or feel they should play or that apply to them socially. The characteristics of race that that were used to distinguish between races had nothing to do with how one identified what role one was going to participate with how other people viewed you it was just these people come from this place and have darker skin or these people come from this place and have lighter skin or these people come from this place and have these particular physical features and so we're going to classify them um by essentially homologous structures, okay? That is not the, what, what gender mm -hmm. is doing. Gender is not looking around in, in the sense of identifying homologous physical structures. One is more about physical, the other one is more about behavioral, but. Yeah, I, okay. I, uh, I so, found the book, by Matt, the way. You, it oh, is sorry. Race, Why Are We So Different? I found it, uh, and it is Nina Jablonski. Uh, Nina Jablonski uh, is a professor of anthropology at Penn State, and she did some really, really, really cool studies on like variation in human skin coloration and like how it ties into UV distribution on the planet. Really cool shit. Uh, so everybody should buy that book. It's a really good one. Um, anyway, the the yeah, when you talk about gender, um, you cannot boil gender down to, nor can you predict gender by anything that we would use to classify or categorize biological sex. And so similarly, you can't take culture and food and religion and art and music and and dance and all the other things that we associate with race and boil that down to you know it, whatever chromosomes ha you have for skin coloration for hair coloration for eye color for whatever like it's it just doesn't work that way so no i wouldn't say that they're analogous okay and then matt you have said that it is possible maybe to be Transcultural. Yeah, I'm. I'm trying to come up with a. I. I don't know if anybody's ever proposed this before. I don't want to take credit for it, um, but because culture is not just a construct uh, in, in the sense that the concept is a construct, but each individual culture is constructed by the people that do so, and so. If the things that people like when I, on the rare occasions, when I've seen someone claim they were transracial, it falls into two categories. One, they're either trying to say or pretend that they have physical features from a group um, that they associate with, whether they do or not, or they're trying to identify, or they're trying to say, I associate more strongly with this set this package of behaviors and actions, which I think would generally be more accurately described as culture than race. 
um, because mm-hmm. to whatever extent, I, I I wish we'd stop talking about race and having people put their race on things because uh, apart from trying to make sure we're not disparaging people for that characteristic, I don't know that the concept of race has done any good at all. It's done a lot of harm. Um, I don't know that it's done any real good. I think if, if instead we talked more about the cultural differences between people, then all of a sudden it, you know, because let's let's say the black race in the stereotypical sense, um, black folks aren't united in what they do or how they do it or how they talk or how they act or whatever else. The the black culture in the southern United States is going to be different than it is in other places, and the same thing is true irrespective for for uh, you know whatever whatever the race category you want to do. It doesn't apply to everyone in that group. It's there's enough there's more variety within the group that you've identified as a race than there is between that group you identify as a race and some other group that you identify as a race. I think that's probably it. The the variety within the category is wider than the variety between the categories. And so within a particular category, if we take a look at what we're actually defining, that sort of this cultural aspects, um, I can, now you're talking about someone who can more strongly identify with a particular cultural aspect than the one not necessarily assigned at birth or presumed from some other characteristic. This is, been fle- I haven't fleshed this out at all, uh, and it's entirely possible that I've taken an idea and walked off a bridge with it, um, but it's the best I can do because gender is definitely tied to many things, including psychology and how one identifies oneself and how one is viewed and identified by other people. That is not directly yeah. analogous to race, even though we have created both of them as a social construct. Yeah, I would also say, like, the, the, you know, gender is something that varies between cultures. There are plenty of cultures with more than two genders, and there are plenty of cultures that have totally different concepts and, and expectations of the genders that they have than we do. Um, race is something that was, you know, but gender is a pretty universal idea an idea of people acting in certain ways and grouping in certain ways. Race is not nearly as universal and it is not nearly as predictable or, or, or as, as functional as, as gender tends to be. Um, race is something that is mainly just a political and economic um, uh, construct. It was invented by racists for racists um, relatively recently too. Like there was no concept of race the way that we have it today before like the 1700s. Um, so it's, it's just, it's a very new thing that very quickly got ingrained in our culture for all the wrong reasons. Um, but to completely ignore it and to try to phase between it and all these things would be to take something away from somebody. You know what I mean? So like, you know, I, I can sit here and mm-hmm. play the, the bullshit card of, well, I'm colorblind. I don't see color, which is really just trying to avoid the baggage. That's you know what not, I mean? Yeah. yeah but like, at the end of the day, if I were to talk to, if I've, I've talked to my friend who's black and I'm like, oh, you, you're not really black to me. What am I actually saying to that? You know yeah. what I mean? Or I, I, I can be a part I love of this you. too. Is, is right? We're right back to, we're right back to the same thing of Jesus loves you. I love you even though you're black. Even that's, though, that's essentially, exactly, yes. yeah, no, that would yes. be awful. It's like giving them, yes. And, and, and at the end of the day, you know, when, when I get pulled over by a police officer, I'm still going to have a very different experience. If he gets pulled over by a police officer, can he identify as white? Can he tell them, no, officer, I'm transracial, please. Don't, you know, don't, don't put, make me a statistic of, you know, like three times more likely to be pulled out of my car and brutalized as it is today. I'm actually white. Like, don't, th- it just doesn't work that way. You know, can, can, you know, the kids in the town that I used to live in, can they identify as white and get a better school? No. So like, fuck you. It doesn't make, it doesn't work that way. So it's uh yeah the 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 biggest thing that's the most important to remember about this is that of course there has been uh, a derision uh, derision um there's been a, a divisiveness and and pain that comes along with gender as well however gender is something that is uniquely and completely social and it varies from culture to culture from generation to generation from person to person from day to day race is something that has significant historical trauma has never been used 
for any kind of serious overarching good in the long term has changed significantly. You, you, you know, Jewish people used to not be white. Italians used to not be white. It, it was because it, white just meant the people in charge. Um, the, the, it's been changed and, and fucked with and manipulated all the time so much across generations just to make people more money and keep people in power. It's a hegemonic bullshit system that unfortunately is very important in our culture, in our society today. So th this is why, you know, when I was a kid, people told me all the time, you know, race is very real, but don't talk about it. Don't, don't bring it up. The opposite is true. Race is completely fucking bullshit, but it's really important and we need to talk about it more. Um, and you can't just take it away from somebody. You can't, can't strip it anyway. That, yeah, I hope, I hope that answer. I know that's a lot, a lot to take in, but yeah. it's a very important topic. <laughs> yeah. And it's one that unfortunately, uh, is, is difficult to talk about because when you're in a position of authority of, of power and you're used to a position of privilege, equality and talking about that privilege and things like that, those feel like oppression. And so right now in this country, whenever we talk about these things, the people who are historically in positions of privilege and power feel like they're under attack and they need to shut it down. And that sucks, but it's really, really, really important. Yeah. Um, as a black person myself, I don't really understand a lot of like race and like cultural kinds of things because the way I grew up, I was part of a lot of different cultures. Like, um, I have a friend who, uh, like, he's white, but um, I would say, like, people say he's more black than I am. And that I don't really understand. <laughs> but um, I guess, like, um, because he like behaves or um like puts himself out like his language and um like just the things he likes whatever people would say he's black and i feel like the only difference in that is that he's lighter skin color or else he would mm. kind of basically have the same experience as black yeah. people would if not for his skin color well, you see that, and right. like, there's this, there's this dude um, on TikTok. Um, he's a, uh, he's a white guy who was born and raised and has lived his whole life in Jamaica, and he speaks with this yeah. heavy Caribbean accent, and he talks about the food and the language and the culture and the music and all, and people get on to him. They're like, "How dare you mock this culture? This is cultural appropriation. How dare you pretend to be this guy?" Meanwhile, he's got a, another TikTok account, another fr a friend of his who grew up in the same town, who's also Jamaican, who is black, who has to come to his defense all the time. Be like, dude, this is my neighbor. <laughs> what are you talking about? Because we pretend like this is the only defining factor. And it, it yeah, no, I, I totally get where you come from. And isn't it interesting that you as a black person have such a more salient experience of race and racial difference and like all these things than I would? Because for me, I'm just me. I'm forest male white in that order. When people look at me, that's what they see. My friend Kendra is a black woman. And she, we had this conversation, this exact, and she said, you know, she understands that when people talk to her, she is black woman Kendra in that order. I am forest male white in that order. So people see me for who I am before her because she has to go through these lists of, of like categorization in this white culture. How weird is that to think about? Yeah, that's so terrible. interesting that when you brought that up. <laughs> like, like I'm called African American, but like most, like several generations removed from Africa. Like most yeah. of our Whereas I'm just American, I'm not Native European American. American, American. You know. So yeah, like. I don't know. Yeah, but uh, thank you very much for answering my question. Um, Absolutely. My mom was just like trying to tell me that oh, it's in your DNA and you can't like associate with another culture um, because 
it's in your DNA or something like that, and that doesn't make any sense to me. So I wanted to. It's. I think to, uh, you know. The, obviously, uh, there's. You have to be it, careful to not be way. appropriating. But like, a friend of mine said that like there's, e- e- how do you say like there's there's no appropriation without starting at appreciation or something like that. So you have to be careful not to be making a mockery of something, stealing something. But like, of course, go ask questions, go explore, go try things. You know, that's multiculturalism is such a huge part of my life. I couldn't imagine being separated from that. Like that's, I I grew up very poor. And and so we went to every mosque, every temple with who? With gender too. Like this, that kind of exploration. Um, I don't see why not. I think everybody should. Considering, yeah, because like gender is like everyone's gonna say different things of whether what it's like to be a man or a woman or whatever. So yeah, yeah, I think in that way, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> Absolutely, we, we live in a bizarrely heteronormative society, and people should take the time to explore gender, to explore sexuality, to explore culture, to explore all these things, and ask all sorts of questions, and to get real messy, and to to make a bunch of faux pas, and and get corrected a bunch of times. Like that's absolutely necessary. I think so. Thanks so much for calling in. Well, I, I'm glad you. So much. I'm, yeah, I'm glad you found it useful. Please, you know. I I hope the conversation goes better the next time you have it. I I still would also recommend calling in to the Transatlantic Call-In Show. Um, And this is complicated stuff. And nobody, I don't think, including myself, should be pretending that we have... We have it all. Oh, this is knocked out. This is easy. We know this and we know this. And boom, 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 boom. Um, I think that... You know, the the curse of may you always live in interesting times. Um, the fact that we're having conversations about things that are incredibly difficult to get to the heart and soul of who we are, trying to identify how we're different and how we're the same, irrespective of whether we're talking about race, ethnicity, culture, gender, sexuality, et cetera. Um, once upon a time, these things weren't discussed and not in open like this. And while there are a bunch of absolutely hateful, backward, ignorant bigots who just want to troll and fling poo and, you know, um, define this and define this, and if you can't do this, then do this. Uh, Despite the fact that those people exist, it reminds me of a conversation I had about um, the atheist community, and people were like, "Why why is there infighting in the atheist community? And I'm like, the thing to take away is that we are now, the atheist community has grown to the point where rather than being one homogenous, you know, group of white dudes stroking their beards, talking about how God doesn't exist and patting themselves in the back, we have diversified the community enough to where we can have fights and we can have splits and the community keeps growing. So yes, you may end up with the first atheist church and the second atheist church and the third atheist church, but that means that there's still three churches where there once was one. And a, a lot of this is going to be growing pains. And I think that the world is experiencing growing pains on a lot of front, including our dealings with race, gender, sexuality, and other things just, that are that are similarly confusing to people. Yeah, definitely. I think it's, it's yeah. conversations that need to be had more and more. So thanks a bunch for the call. We'll talk to you later. Absolutely. Have a good night. We we have um we have a hypothetical question from the next caller. Somebody's coming in ah. into my room with food. Oh yeah. Somebody good brought stuff. me food. Who does this? I don't even know where it's from or what it is. I have tater tot. Oh my god, it's fucking pluckers. It's like that that meme. If you see someone oh my who god, looks I identical got to you, run immediately. Uh, yeah, so when the show's over, uh, yeah, I email. I'll bring you paper towels. Oh, no, I would need paper towels, I would need ketchup for the pl- anyway. We're, we're ignoring the callers, ketchup and plates. Jimmy, bring no, me no, no, food don't, too. I'll eat it later. Uh, here we go. Let me stop being rude to everybody. I appreciate the fact that they brought food, but they could have timed it for when the show was over. Uh, we have is it Jara or Jara? Jara, hello. Jara from New York, you, you had a question for us. So welcome. Oh, yeah. 
it really uh everything's really complicated these days as they always were i guess <laughs> yeah. but yeah we're just more I open about hypothetical i just are. wanted your thoughts on and thank goodness for it uh but good evening gentlemen uh yes i did want to pose a question and uh just really get your thoughts on this it's that timeless question after 1945 or so uh would you kill baby hitler and then uh, I want to expound on that a little bit. If you could change nothing else in history um, except that, um, would you? No. Sorry, I'm a little nervous on the air. No, you're fine. Yeah, I, I don't know, man. Because, uh, like, it, it is the really nice thing to say this, but also uh, these concepts of, of ethnicity and of, of genocide and all of these things were already around. Uh, Hitler was definitely a catalyst, but he wasn't the only one doing it. So, like, would it have fixed oh, anything? And sure. also, you don't know the, the, the ramifications of what happened afterwards. Maybe if you had killed baby Hitler, you would have had something worse. I, I don't know. I just it's it's hard to fuck with history, man. It's it's hard to think about it. Yeah, very. True. I, I don't know. I, I don't know I how to determine. See your line of thinking on that. The the other thing is okay. You kill baby Hitler. Um, maybe it's Hitler's brother that grows up with that favored position um, that encourages things. What if you kill Hitler's parents um, bef before they have Hitler? Cool. Does somebody else rise up in his place? What if you kill Hitler's parents um, after he was born so they had to be raised by somebody else who might treat him in a more loving way? The, you can't know enough in a complex um, environment to say, oh, well, let's just go kill baby Hitler. Yeah, it's it's hard because like when he and I know this is probably supposed to be a fun question, but as people who professionally no. overthink things, as Matt and I, I wanted are, to take it into it's, Yeah, it's it's really difficult because you don't actually know what the real, real ramifications were. Because like Hitler wasn't the only guy in charge of the Holocaust. The Holocaust wasn't the only uh, genocide that's been going on. Uh, uh, the concept of race, which Hitler based his insanity on, had already been around for a couple of hundred years by the time he came about. Maybe we can go back further and fucking kill Linnaeus or something and like figure that out. But like, there's, it's just there's no good way to know for sure that you're doing something that's actually making things only better. And then it's like the trolley problem of it's like, okay, well, yeah, you, you prevented the Holocaust, but you caused this other cosmic horror. Was that better? Or was it, are their deaths now on your hands or not? Or like, did you pull the lever at the right time? You know, it's, oh, it's such a weird one. We should just murder everybody is what it is. And I pause you right there. Approach and just, just, you know, we'd be done with it. But I could pause you right there because I just want to say something. Sure. I completely agree with you where you're coming from with your stances, the both of you. And I do think. Hello. Did we lose you? What was that? Was that like maybe a prank call where they hung up on themselves? Just to the point where know. they. I want to hear what they had to say. <laughs> It shows them still on the line. Well, I'm going to drop it. We got three more calls to get to and uh, and then Super Chats. And then I have food here that's going to actually get cold. So that's the cool thing go. about yeah, I forgot who said it. Something like that's That's the thing about being white is we can play with these ideas of going back in time. We can go back in time and see things and do stuff and all this stuff. Other, uh, other races don't get that opportunity. They don't get to pretend like, oh, what if I went back in time? Wouldn't it be fun? No. <laughs> So quick notes in case I forget in the uh, in the the commotion that's going on. Huge thank you to all of our mods. Uh, and today I'll single out I Got Cookies and Ilya just because they popped up on the screen right away. We really appreciate everybody. But also a huge thank you to Ben who's screening calls. And tomorrow on the Translating Colin Show, it's Katie and Arden. So it's like the OG Takis tomorrow. Uh, on Sunday, Jimmy and I will be doing uh, the Sunday show. And on Monday, I hear you're doing Skeptic Calendar or with with Erica. Yeah, yeah, Erica and I'll be on Skeptic on Monday, the 13th. Skeptic. I don't know why I said Skepticality. Skeptic. Wow, <laughs> Matt, you're fired. You don't even know the names you, of the shows you, on your own damn network. Show. What's wrong here? But uh, on that note, we've got 
Mike in Washington. Pronouns are he, him. Welcome, Mike. How can we help? Hey, uh, great to talk to you both. Um, so I, I would say uh, I'm probably in the midst of a deconstruction, still piecing that out. Um, but I, I read an article that my dad had around about God's promises and, and climate change lies. Um, and I, I'm just curious as to know what ways we can kind of combat the thought that climate change isn't happening because in Genesis, God says, you know, the, the seasons and the weather will always be the same. And, uh, and the so we can, that do that, exactly we can do that. For, we can do that in the same way that we can say that Genesis got the order of events in creation wrong. Mm-hmm. Yeah, do you do you like ask ask this this parent of yours, do you believe that plants existed before the sun did? And if so, how? <laughs> like that's yeah, that's that's the whole thing. Is it like if if they're gonna fall back on, well, the Bible said this, therefore, blah, blah, blah. I don't think that it makes any sense to single out climate change as opposed to anything else. I can sit here and go over the different evidences for climate change for you if you like. I'd be happy to go for you through a few of them. But it doesn't change shit if you're starting from the premise of the Earth is six thousand years old and this book says so, therefore it's real. Yeah, I would also yeah, as one I, last I, little I, thing on this. Uh, there's a resource I would recommend, and that is go to talkorigins.org, and there's the index to creationist claims, and now everything that they say, pretty much. Um, in from a creationist perspective is addressed everything in in all kinds of different categories they discuss it from philosophy and theology uh from biology abiogenesis genetics molecular biology physiology and anatomy it's here just for funsies i'll pick out a couple things um evolution is racist that's ca005 you click on that and it will show you what the actual science is behind it uh creationism and evolution are the only two models it'll answer that um, I'm sure there's one in here on the order of events in Genesis. Um, Check yeah, Genesis on one got the order of events right. And that day age creationism goes through and shows that the creation account in Genesis lists 10 events in the order from a beginning, a primitive earth and darkness, light an expansive atmosphere, large areas of dry land, land plants, sun, moon, and stars, sea monsters and flying creatures, wild and tame beasts, and then man. The odds of getting that order correct are, uh, by chance are 1 in 3,628,800. But the real order is a beginning, then light, then sun and stars, then earth, moon, and atmosphere, then dry land, sea creatures, some land plants, land creatures, flying creatures, then mammals, and then the first birds, the fruiting plants, et cetera. And, so, and it gives references in there. It's like a little uh, miniature Wikipedia for responding to creationist claims. I keep it up whenever I'm on the show because I can't possibly keep all of this memorized. You, if you can't find it, just Google index to creationist claims and you will find it at talk origins. All right. If you're I, into I books, was kind of, there's also this one. This is from uh, Mark Isaac. I think this is from a university. It's from the university of California and it's called the counter creationism handbook. And it's, it's a very, it's the same thing, but it's not as expansive as, a website would be but it's a lot of fun because like this is another one it's just this was published in uh 2007 and like literally you can go through this and pull like any, any half the time when i'm on this show or, or any of these shows something somebody says is in great detail in here with a bunch of scientific citations on like here's why this is bullshit <laughs> it's it's yep. amazing how unimaginative they are <laughs> yeah i as I was about to say, I, I think what really shocked me is because I knew he'd been reading, like, bogus science, and the, the same article references terrible, terrible science, but it, it tried to make the point that climate change activism and belief in it is, is literally evil because humans are supposed to flourish and have dominion over the earth, and I... I uh -huh. I'd never considered that that might be going on in, you know, my dad's head. Whereas I'm learning these ideas and, and making these changes in my fundamental belief. I didn't even know how to approach it, but it's 
the research yeah. has sound good. Yeah, and that's the thing is that it's it's yet another case of you know science versus religion. It's just like with with creationism. Um, when people say that, you know, well, evolution isn't true. Well, fuck, dude. I don't know what to tell you. Here's all this evidence. And with climate change, like, we can look at ice cores. We can look at forams. We can we can look at, at dendrochronology. We can look at a million different things and show that this is very real and very scary. It is the greatest existential threat to human life currently facing us. We need to take care of it while we still have the choice to do so. Um, but first, we have to agree on whether or not evidence is important and then what evidence is, and then which evidence actually matters, and then what the evidence says. And that is a long uphill battle. And, and in the case of, you know, what your dad's saying is, is, oh, well, it was put here for man to use, and so it's not going to... This is stuff that came from, you know, I, I, mean, I remember hearing Rush Limbaugh talking about it on the air, uh, you know, in the, in the 90s. Um, that's an assertion about what we're here for that he can't demonstrate my favorite. I just like to, or one of my favorite entries on the entire index to creationist claims is Kent Hovind made a claim about the universe is not billions of years old. And in it, he said, the Sahara desert is expanding at such a rate that it can only be a few thousand years old indicating a young earth. And the response here is yes, the Sahara desert is only a few thousand years old. What does that have to do with the age of the earth? I mean, you might as well be talking about, you know, uh, Pangea and continental drift and all this other stuff. Yet yeah, deserts come and go. The climate of various ages changes. Maybe the Saharan desert's fairly young, but that doesn't tell you anything about how the age of the earth is any more than, um, you know, the, the Great Pyramid at Giza is only, you know, <laughs> a few thousand years old. If the earth was really billions of years old, there would be pyramids everywhere, man. Yeah. I get it. I went to a man-made thing, which is a bad analogy, but anyway. no, it's, it, it is like, that's the thing is like, you know, I, I've heard similar arguments and like these people just need to learn what a fucking biome is and like how they're classified. Cause like, it's not like the desert's just going to pop up in the Amazon, like a legion. Like, it's crazy. Ah, uh, it's nuts. But yeah, no, it's, 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 uh, it's difficult to have to have these conversations when you first have to understand whether or not the conversation matters and, and what evidence there is and what evidence there is and all this stuff. So if your parent is just stuck on this idea that the Bible is right and that God gave us dominion over earth, the first thing I would ask is if, if someone that really is that you should look up to, if this great important thing gave you a present, why would you treat that present like shit? If he gave us dominion over the earth and you really oh. believe that, we should take care of this gift that he gave us and make sure that we are treating it effectively so that we can continue to live here. Because the science that we are hurting the planet and destroying the climate is unavoidable. So because God gave us this earth, we should make sure that we're taking good care of it, taking good care of this gift that God gave us and, and, and making it beautiful for all the future generations to see this beautiful planet and then get to go to heaven. I would absolutely play into that shit. And then we can get to deconstruction later. But first, right now, holy crap, we need like energy reform and, and, and effective climate action. Um, that would be great. And it's going to take a lot less time to fix that than hopefully than religion, probably. Is that, does that help, Mike, or you got another no, question? Like that. No, no, that, that helps. And uh, I like that idea a lot, that, of course, just expounded on. And, and I think I'll take a look at the resources. So I thank you guys for your time. Thanks so much. No worries. Go to uh, climate.nasa.gov as well if you want some really easy educational resources. Uh, climate.nasa.gov. Yep. Um, well, uh, yeah. Matter of fact, if one of the mods could put climate.nasa.gov in in the chat, that'll I'm be ninety nine percent sure. That's the that's the way. Let me just double check. Climate.nasa.gov. Let me just make sure that's the one. Uh, yeah, that's the one. And it it immediately has readouts here of like carbon dioxide is at four hundred twenty parts per million. Arctic sea ice minimum extent is down uh, 12.6% uh, per decade since 1979. Uh, sea level is up four inches since 1993. Like it just, the data are right there for you to play with and read. Um, I'll put it right here in the chat for you. Oh my On God, note, I just copied so much shit about stable isotopes because I copied the wrong thing. Oh Lord, no. There we go. On that note, we've got Eric in Michigan, pronouns him. Welcome, Eric. You're having, I hear you're having difficulty with your parents. Yeah, I'm having a similar problem to Mike. Uh, my dad 
recently started sharing a lot of uh, creationist like uh, like videos and like posts and all that stuff uh, yeah. to me on Facebook. Um, and I he never was a creationist. He's like we were brought up like as like cafeteria Christians. Like we were like oh we went to church, but like not even every weekend, like some of the time. And uh, he kind of fell down the QAnon hole, like when that happened. Uh, he retired right around the same time that was coming up. And I feel like he's, like, they're dedicated, like, they're, like, there's a pipeline that kind of, like, has caused him to go into creationism. And I don't know, like, how to give him resources that he won't just dismiss offhand. I don't either. I, I can give you resources. I can point you to the index to creationist claims. I can point you to climate.nasa.gov. Um, there's no way of knowing what your dad is or isn't going to dismiss out of hand. And and I think perhaps maybe before before any further conversation takes place, we should talk, not you and I, we in the broader sense of you and your, your dad and say, what sources would be good for you? What, what, where can I go to find data that you will accept? Because if I find data and you don't agree with it, you can just say, well, I don't accept that source or I don't, you know, I think there's a conspiracy going on or whatever else. So would you accept scientifically peer reviewed journals? Would you accept um, official government positions? What if they were official government positions held by 10 different nations? Um, you know, what if it's Nobel Prize winning research? What if it's this? And see, because if you get to a point where there's nothing amongst the reputable sources that he'll accept, then that's the issue. Not climate change, not what he thinks about climate change, not whether or not your dad's going to vote based on his ignorance of climate change. That issue has to be solved first. If we can't agree on what sources we should use and how we're going to get to the truth, then nothing you do is going to make any difference. That that is kind of the tricky thing is that like when when you talk about things like this to you know, about young earth creationism about QAnon about whatever else you know if I found somebody with a PhD in biology who was going to come out and say that that uh, evolution isn't real they would hold this person up as a hero and say clearly they're smart and they know what they're talking about because they have a PhD in biology and clearly they know what they're but when I show you the vast majority of PhD biologists who say that evolution very clearly is real, well, they've been indoctrinated. That's why they got the PhD, because they're part of this indoctrination system that the, co the colleges train you to say these things. And like all of a sudden, not only is, are they wrong, but the whole system is wrong. If I point you to government statistics showing that, you know, uh, 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 you know black and brown Americans are, are you know, significantly more likely to experience violence at the hands of the police and, and be arrested for things that they didn't do and all these things. Well, those are all bullshit government corrupts. To do. This is the dark evil government. This is the shadow government. This is the, if I were to somehow find something on the, the Bureau of Ju uh, Justice Statistics or the Justice Department that showed that, you know, actually, you know, it turns out that none of this is real and that, that black people are just evil, that I guarantee all these people be like, see, see, the government even says, and it's all, all of a sudden we can trust this. And uh, it's the same people who like to quote, you know, they'll they'll find some random ass paper on on NCBI and be like, see, there's this uptick in myocarditis with with the vaccines. But when you show them all the actual research about how vaccines work and all the doctors saying, no, really, this is the best thing. They're all bought and paid for by Pfizer, even though they're doing the exact same research with the exact same results. So, um, yeah, it's what I would recommend doing. And this is shitty. This is a sneaky thing to do. Um, a lot of the time when talking to people who are just down this QAnon rabbit hole, they're down this idea of, of, of you know, this, this kind of patriot thinking, um, it's more important what's being said and how it's being said than, than like what actually the substance is. So if you want to talk about climate change with one of these MAGA hat people, you talk about American energy. And how there's, we need strong American-made <laughs> business energy. 
We don't want to be getting our our oil from these 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 you know uh, uh, Middle Eastern nations that are hostile towards us. We want American wind power and American solar power, American power making American jobs on American soil. So we have energy freedom, freedom from these other countries. We have American energy freedom, and that's a way easier sell. You want to talk about? capitalism we need to be tearing down these you need to break up big pharma and big oil and big tech the workers the american workers should be running these companies better than these billionaire bullshit liberals are all these you know these techie people with their their socialist agenda the americans should be running these companies and the, the workers should own the production which is socialism but don't tell them that and like that's you just just Honestly, if you frame things this way, I find I get a lot better response out of it. Um, you know, we can all agree, you know, when, when the FBI raided Mar-a-Lago, that's clearly this corrupt. And really, when we look at it, all these polices are, are corrupt against uh, the, the white American patriots. So we need to dismantle and defund the police and put something better in place that saves taxpayer dollars. And yeah, I agree, bro. Yeah, uh, <laughs> fake ab. Uh, <laughs> like this. So like you have this, this kind of system here where um, uh, it, it, it's more important about how you're saying things and, and what you're presenting because I guarantee it, if you come in and say, hey, uh, listen, man, we need to be investing in green energy because it's better for the environment, the answer will be no. But if the question is, can we make Americans accept the Chinese? This is true. The Chinese are beating us at scientific paper output, at research, and making wind uh, turbines. They make more turbines and more scientists. We need the best American universities making the best American science and the best American turbines to harness the American wind what goes sweeping down the plains. And that's, that's how we should be presenting it, I think, to your QAnon family and to other QAnon families out there. Yeah, <laughs> tell me that wouldn't get <laughs> that, me elected. That's a lot. Tell me that wouldn't get me elected in Trump country. Hey, I would vote for you because, like, I am very lefty myself, but my dad is <laughs> the exact opposite. He holds so many like just contradictory opinions. Like he he like he was like, oh, I was thinking about getting a Cybertruck because Elon Musk is a conservative darling now. But he's like, oh, electric cars. Like, uh, what if they run out of electricity and I can't charge them at my house? So, like, I'm like, yeah. well, like how often does your power go out? Like, is that even a thing that you need to worry about? Yeah. Like, with I don't understand. <laughs> no, 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 no. What if your car with gasoline runs out? You don't have a fucking gasoline dispenser at your house. You can't refuel it there. Exactly you do is. have electricity at your house. Of the two, one of them is automatically preferable. <laughs> yeah. So, I yeah, I can't even dispute that, so. I was just like, because he's, because he's retired now, he spends a lot of time, like every time I talk to my mom, she's like, he's out in his car listening to podcasts, going down like the rabbit hole and everything. And I just wanted to know if there's like maybe like any resources where he's going to want to fight the person or like, like should I direct him to like a, like a show like this and just let him like, um, to want to argue and then just be disproven or anything like that. Like, I don't know if that would be helpful or hurtful or. Anything like that. <laughs> it's, it's hard because there actually is data. Like there's a, a cool, there's a study called Cool Dudes. Excuse me, I'm real burpish because I'm drinking soda pop. Um, there's a study, I believe it's called Cool Dudes. And they took like, if I remember, I might be mixing this up with another one, but like uh, they took like white conservative Christian men and, and who were very anti-climate change. And they found like the more actual data and science that they taught them about climate change the more they were like this is all bogus this is all horseshit this is evil this is this is all lies and so like the biggest thing you have to remember is that humans are incredibly tribalistic and especially here in america we make political ideology like a part of your personhood um and so, like, if I'm wrong about this, then I'm not as good of a person as I thought I was. And I'm a different, you know, who am I really? And so when you show them something that ca challenges their worldview, they end up 
being confused to the point where like, if, if climate change is real and I've been saying it isn't, then not only am I not a Republican anymore, then I'm not a Christian anymore. And that means that I'm not, I'm not me anymore. And like, so they'll buckle down more and more and more and more into their help, their beliefs, even when presented with good evidence. In fact, the more good evidence you give them, the more likely they are to say, ah, yeah. it's, it's, it's not real. So you're going to have to find a way what? around it, man. And, uh, and part of that is deconstruction. So it's, it's a long, hard road. One one thing we we know okay. is that people who've made a public profession of a belief are more likely to double down in the face of evidence to the contrary than they are to change their mind in the face of evidence to the contrary, at least initially. And so it takes some work because the embarrassment of having to say, "Oh my gosh, I've been wrong all this time," um, that's big and, and difficult. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I was, I'm afraid he's immunized himself, like, against good science by listening to a lot of the, like, uh, pseudoscience. Like, he sent me something about ice cores being not reliable because, like, what if it snows more than once a year? And I'm like, that there's, like, they do does lots he, of does he have science any expertise? on this. I don't, does I don't he have, have any answers, but... Does he have any expertise in that? And has he bothered to look in to whether or not the scientists have an answer about whether or not it snows or ice is more than once a year? Because I'm pretty sure the people who study this have thought of that. That you're not sitting there at home yeah. going, well, I think I've just discovered the flaw in the scientific research here that I've never bothered to study or look into or even ask if anybody has. That That is the thing is like you really and like that's something that I love to ask people who are anti-science this way is like, do you really genuinely think that the people in like master's programs for climatology haven't thought of that yet? Like that they have never come up with that, that you are so star spangled smart that you came up with something that none of these scientists have ever considered. Um, and it's not impossible. It's certainly not impossible, but what's more likely that you not even knowing half of the terminology for this found some massive flaw in the system that nobody's noticed before, or that you misunderstood the thing you're talking about. Um, it's why, you know, I, even if there's something about physics that I don't understand, I am never going to sit here and say that it doesn't make any sense because I am not a physicist and I'm not a physicist on purpose because I've taken some physics classes. I needed them for my undergrad and it wasn't nearly as good as biology for me. So I don't do that anymore. <laughs> so like, I'm not going to sit here and say, yeah, well, this, this massive hole in black hole theory, you know, blah, blah, blah. That's not for me to do. I'm not going to do it. <laughs> okay. I'll check out some of the resources you recommended earlier uh, as well in the uh, show. So, and hopefully I'll use hey, that to kind of try and talk him off the ledge. Yep. <laughs> well, good luck Thanks, to Eric. you. If you find out, if you find out how to change his mind, call in and tell us how you did it so we can do it for everybody else. Yep. Oh yeah. I'll write a research paper. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and then Forrest and I'll be the only ones that read it. <laughs> Anyway, uh, yeah, it's funny, you know, as if uh, I don't hear that much about ice cores, but once upon a time it was, oh, this particular dating method um, mm. is unreliable. And, and they do that without recognizing that the beauty of the, of the various dating methods we use is that they overlap. Carbon dating only lasts about 50,000 years, but it overlaps on either end with these here and everything else. And so you take multiples and compare them and not for each individual thing. You're not going to be able to do multiple dating methods on this piece of pottery, but you do multiple dating methods where you can. And what that does is it shows you the reliability. It's not that we're saying these dating methods are perfect. It's, just, it's that we're so good at understanding them, we can tell you how imperfect they are. Yep. I remember reading, there was a, uh, this one, this one here, it's called engaging archeology. span And it's just a collection of like archeological papers, most like a lot of like PhD uh, dissertations and just cool research papers and shit. And they're all written. Uh, they, this, the author shares the summary of the paper. And then the rest of the chapter is here's how it went wrong. And here's how horrible it was. And it's just, it's like, practices that they that they learned in research by fucking shit up over and over and like what they learned doing the research that wasn't the research and like there were a couple of them in here that i remember that they were like 
Yeah, well, we went ahead and did like, you know, uh, 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 thermoluminescent dating because that's what we're supposed to do. But we also did carbon dating, and then we went ahead and did potassium too, just to be triple sure, because we fucked it up like 30 times before this. And so we wanted to make sure, and like, that's a constant theme, is like this idea of like, we're, ju- we're not just going to make sure we know it. We're going to make sure we really know it. Yeah. All right. Final call of the night that we're going to get on to is Super Chats. We have John uh, Pranza. He him, and okay. has a question for us about Islam. So welcome, John. Hey, um, him on, on the air? Yep. You are. Yeah, um, so I just wanted to know, um, so I am a theist of a non-Islamic background. Um, I consider myself to have li- more liberal interpretations um, in the sense I don't believe in some gay people and such. Um, this is less so a theological question about the validity of Islam, Christianity, Judaism, etc., um, but more about um, how politically feasible would be to um, theologically reform the Islamic world. What did you just yeah, say? Yeah, I have no ago? idea, but I have I have no reason to think it's likely. Go ahead, Forrest. Oh, just, I, I didn't hear well, what you, you said. You were more more left leaning or more more liberal. He wants to know, know is is yeah, Islam I, reformable? I'm a liberal, but I'm not oh no no no! I, I heard I, that. It, I heard that. It's just when you were explaining it, you said you're more liberal in certain things, and then you said something very quickly after that. And I, well, I, I'm saying I know I'm what a, I thought a theist I heard. who happens to have liberal views on theism. <laughs> okay. So I don't I'm, believe in fundamentalism. I could have sworn you said something fucking nuts, and I'm just going to move on. I apologize for wasting your time. So you, go on now. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I was, so I was asking, do you think it'll ever be possible to politically or theologically reform the Islamic world through interpretation? Uh, not any more than any other religion. And in fact, probably less likely because well, Islam so, has that um, caveat so, of saying that it is the last final word of God and it cannot be changed. So like l- probably less likely, but I would say out of I, all I, of it. So I um, come from a many. So, hey, am I on the air? Yeah. Yes. Hey, so I come from a background, but I have many different members of um, my family history who are come from Christian, Jewish. Um, it's in our backgrounds, and I study theology a lot because I just think it's a very important thing to study how you interpret it. And I think the main difference between Islam, Judaism, and Christianity is each of them have a different way of interpreting. So Christianity um, gets away with a lot of the stuff in the Old Testament about slavery, stoning gay people, etc. The fact that Christianity uh, only listens to Jesus and can ignore the Hebrew Bible, and Judaism gets away with it because modern Talmudic Judaism um, believes in the oral Torah but doesn't listen to the Hebrew Bible. So Talmud is a much higher authority than the Hebrew Bible, which is also why Judaism. Whereas Islam says the Quran is the final word of God and so it has to deal with all the bad behaviors of Muhammad. So I think trying to parse out the individual theologies of each of these religions and how they'll try and manifest is important. I think the only real way you're going to try and... Um, and the issue with Islam specifically is that um, you have to rely on the Imam or an individual Muslim. So it's going to have to take a lot of work to try and pressure individual Muslims to say maybe the way you interpret a uh, Quran would have to be more in the context of time, et cetera, et cetera, for them to become more liberal or pluralistic in their societies. It's a lot okay, cool. than other religions, I think. Yeah, uh, but cool. do you think that'll ever happen, or do you think that for... We, um, we, already, that answer, we, already, answered, we, we already answered the question. Neither of us think it's likely to happen. I, yeah, the, but why you know, stuff um, about if, Islam? If, John, stuff about Islam has Christian already Indian changed Judaism quite has... a bit. Hold on, stuff about Islam has already changed in the past. For example, you know there used to be plenty of drawings and artwork about Muhammad, and now it's very much taboo. And so, like thing things like that change all the time. Um, Islam used to be. Um, or I should say like Islamic cities um, used to be capital uh, capitals of scientific development and learning. There's a reason why most of the stars in the night sky have Arabic names. Um, there's a reason why algorithm is an Arabic word. Um, there's a reason why algebra is an Arabic word. Um, so Islam has already changed quite a bit. It will probably change in the future as far as whether it's going to become more liberal or more you know, progressive or whatever. That has more to do with how desperately it will try to hold on to social relevance. But at the end of the day, it's still a religion. It's still a dogma, and it's unlikely it's going to change too strongly. Now, I have to ask you, 
I, I can't get away from the fact I I am ninety nine percent sure I heard you say this. You do what? Do you believe that gay people exist? I swear to God, you said I don't believe yes, in I gay. Yes, I said people. I don't believe. No, I said I'm liberal because I don't believe in stoning gay people. That homosexuality is immoral. Doesn't believe in stoning. It is immoral. Is immoral. That's the whole half the chat agreed with me. We all heard you say I don't believe in gay people. And I just had to I had to know before we moved on any further with this call. I thought you said gay people weren't real or that you didn't believe in them or you didn't listen to them. I was gonna lose it. Okay, you don't believe in stoning them. I agree. Great. Okay, cool. <laughs> yes. Way to take the high road. Oh, <laughs> Yeah, well, I think uh, the only right. thing about that is, um, in the same way Christian societies may, uh, may have used to been a certain way, and we've moved on from that after the Enlightenment, um, I don't yes, see why... Yes, there are Islamic differences. There, the, so, John, you already went through and went through and highlighted the differences, and Forrest highlighted the differences, and I said that I don't know, but I don't think that it's likely. I think there are things about Islam that make it more rigid than Christianity, but yes, it can potentially change depending on who's popular and who takes charge, but I can't predict the fucking future, so I told you what I thought was going to happen. Do we have some way, uh, apart from waiting, to find out which of us is correct? I guess that I think it um, it would just have to be a long course of dialogue with the Islamic world. But you're right; it, you can only judge in retrospect what, what will happen. Yep. And on that front, I gotta let it go and move on. We got super chats. Thanks for calling, John. Pleasure. Take care, John. All right. I'm glad to hear that you think gay people exist. I was seriously worried for a second. I, I I'm not. I alone. heard it. So many people I, in chat. It's so weird. <laughs> I heard it. I knew what he said. I was trying to correct it so that we could just move on because the last thing we needed was to get john thinking we were beating him up for denying the existence of gay people but he had already gone on he'd already gone on to address it in another comment you guys were so obsessed about not hearing what he said the first time that you didn't hear the second comment that he said about gay people but here we go i couldn't get past it i was sitting here like surely surely i'm crazy surely i misheard it All right, let us, now here's the test. (laughs) Oh, love of mine, please put up Super Chats on the screen as I remind people that coming up tomorrow on the Transatlantic Call-In Show is going to be Katie and Arden. Um, Huge thank you to Ben for screening calls tonight. That was really good stuff. Um, On Sunday, Jimmy and I are going to be doing the Sunday show, and on Monday, Forrest and Erica will be doing Skep Talk. Um, So here we go, $10 and one penny. From Daffy Stardust, what do you guys think virtue signaling is? People seem to be using it in different ways, and sometimes it seems like people who complain about it a lot are themselves virtue signaling. I was going to show you something uh, cool. Hang on. You're going to what? I'm going to show you something cool. I'm interrupting the show, everybody. Uh, so on Facebook Messenger, I just sent you a link. Click that. Really? It's on your network. You're fine. I'm not showing you porn. Sit here and just... So now click view queue. This, because you're on the same network, you can actually, it start at the bottom, but you can actually send them to yourself. So you don't have to wait on us if you wanted to. You could go to the next one, Greg Markowski, and hit send when you're ready. If you want to, this option's available when you're on the same network. I find it super cool. What, what, you say click Jimmy send, but there is nothing here that says send. So click like click the next one that is Greg and then there's a send button. Oh, yeah. but is this what you want me to do? Because right now there's somebody else doing it. It's more of a, if you want, I know sometimes people get frustrated with me when like, I don't get to it as quick cause I'm curating super chats. And so, uh, it's one way. Are they more, are they more frustrated with that? Or are they more frustrated when they're watching a show and we're sitting here talking about something else and they're not seeing any of that on the screen? I think they're all happy to see me. That, uh, that's true. <laughs> Everybody's happy to see you. you want All right. Ketchup? No, I, I want to get the show fucking finished I so I can eat it. my wings. <laughs> I'm still waiting for Jimmy Snow to bring me wings. I'm very upset that I wasn't involved in this. Well, it's a good thing. So um, <laughs> what do I think virtue signaling is? Um, I think oftentimes it's a label that's put on someone when they say, you don't really care, you're just doing it for effect. You're just doing it for, you know, oh, I'm doing this for attention or whatever else. And there are certainly people that do it. Um, in some cases, I think it's a 
a, a real problem. You know, people who are, you get labeled like keyboard warrior because what change are you really making just sitting there on social media? But you don't want to over, under, uh, you don't want to underestimate the power of, of educating people and forming people. Um, if, if there are homeless people in Austin and there are tons of them and I go down and I pass out sandwiches, does it really matter whether I'm doing it to gain applause or notoriety or get a write up in the newspaper to say how awesome I am? Like if my motivation is so that people will think I'm super awesome, does it really change whether or not people got fed? And so when you're talking about virtue signaling, I think the only time that it really comes into play is when someone's doing something that does not cost them anything other than saying what their view is. And if they're not, you know, engaging on it, et cetera, um, it's trying to show that I'm a better person than I am. Uh, but at the end of the day, if you're constantly showing what a good person you are, aren't you a good person? I don't know. Yeah, it, it does kind of play into the idea of like, I think it was, uh, who was it? I think it was Aristotle who talked about like moral morality is like something you do, not something you are. And it has to be practiced and things like that. Yeah. But like at the end of the day, for me, uh, the only time I've ever heard the word virtue signaling thrown around in a, like in an actual context, um, was when somebody has no other argument besides the fact, how dare you tell me that, you know, what's right and wrong. You're clearly just doing it for attention. Um, and it's not ever been productive. It's like, if, if you're talking about homelessness, if I say we should fix homelessness and they say, no, I, the homeless are there on purpose. They're all drug addicts and blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and if I'm like, actually, here's the statistics that shows that like almost 50% of all people, all those people have jobs. And like when they're in a shelter, it's actually more than 50%. They have an income. They have, they're working. It's just the system is broken. And then quickly the conversation, well, you're just virtue. You're just trying to say that, oh, yeah, you're such a good person taking care of the homeless. And this is a way of avoiding a conversation that is uh, potentially uncomfortable for somebody. So, yeah. Thank you. I'm very happy to be virtue signaling because I think that virtue is important. Uh, yeah. I, I'm more upset by the people who are very clearly vice signaling on a regular basis. Vice signaling like that. Listen, Jerry's. Am I reading this? What, what am I? Oh, I don't know. We're going you back are. and forth. Uh, 1999 from Greg Markowski. Matt, Forrest, and Jimmy, thanks for the great show. Thank you, Greg Markowski, there you go. for being here today. Thank you, Greg. Appreciate it. $20 from Omega theory, intelligence and corruption are positively correlated. Controlling for other variables, more intelligence leads to finding more cracks in the system, leading to more temptations to cheat, which leads to more cheating. I don't know if I buy that. I don't know if I buy that. I, I could definitely say that like there, you could find the cracks in the system and exploit them, but I don't think that's necessarily like I don't think there's a correlation. I don't think there's a next step. I think a lot I of think, dumb people find ways to be cheaters as well. I, I think there are a lot of brilliant people who's, who've spent time thinking about the perfect crime and don't ever do anything about it other than writing a good movie or mystery novel uh, rather than actually acting it out. I certainly think that, um, that there may be correlation. Um, but I think that also... If you take a look at it from a Dunning-Kruger perspective, there are people who are not particularly bright, who the problem is they think they are bright. They think they can beat the system, and this is going to lead to trying to find cracks in the system and more cheating. So, yeah, I think it, you're going to get it on both ends. Yeah. $20 from Heisenberg. The, the Berg of Heisen's uh, morning guys. So just listening to the intro brings to mind how salmon can return to the place of their birth. Amazing. It is really cool. Um, and they do so at the cost of their own lives as the part, point of their life cycle. Um, they, they go back to that stream out of salt water into fresh water in order to spawn. And they die doing it because evolution doesn't give a shit what happens to you after you reproduce. Yep. It's funny because it, we're missing a, cat right now um one of our cats got out and and has run off we don't know if they're ever going to come back but one of the first recommendations that many people said was put the litter box out there because evidently cats can smell a litter box from like 10 miles away or something uh, i have no idea how that could possibly work 
and I'm not even sure that that's accurate, uh, but I definitely can't smell a litter box or anything else from 10 miles away. And so finding out that there are animals with abilities and perhaps sensory information that we don't have and couldn't possibly process because we're con constantly anthropomorphizing the animals and and try that leads us to conclude that they have a knowledge or understanding where it may be they have a tendency and an ability um mm. so that that kind of gets to what we're what we were talking about earlier yeah the reason why you can't smell that litter box from a mile away by the way is because you're a primate olfaction is significantly reduced in all primates in order to make way for superior vision so you see 10 times better than your, your your household pets, but they can smell better than you can see. And that's weird to think about. Um, uh, 500 jigs. What is that? Jigs. Che che Czechoslovakian dollars? I'm going to guess. I don't know what this is. Yeah. 500 of them. Uh, holy shit. Um, from Niresh. Uh, thanks for being such a positive force in my world, Forrest. I got you su such a kind thing for you to say to me, and I'm here making fun of your currency. Uh, my emotionally and sexually abusive ex just texted my mom to try to get under my skin again successfully. I'm so sorry to hear that. That fucking sucks. People like you help me have faith in humanity anyway. Love and reason, heart. That's, that's a great sign-off. Um, yeah, uh, uh, abuse sticks with you, man, and it can last for a long time, so... Give yourself some some uh, uh, comfort in knowing that that you're not alone in that. Lots of people suffer with that, and give yourself some time and some patience and some ability to heal. Buy yourself some nice soup, and take a nice hot shower, uh, and 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 take it easy and try to let that roll off of you like water off a duck. So for that's... real though, eat ice cream yeah. in a hot shower. Try it; it's fantastic. Okay, hot shower bowl of ice cream do it it's great for the psyche all right well now now i, I want to do, do that even though but, but i gotta do it another time this check, check corona as well thanks so much Naresh. ten dollars from michaela throne thanks for giving me something to watch while enduring god's curse i used to blame pain during menstruation on eve what is the evolutionary reason either way created perfectly uh either way created perfectly my foot oh created perfectly my foot i get what you're saying um, gotcha. let me, let me, let me jump in before, before Forrest does to tell you the actual science behind it. Um, I'm pretty sure that it causes pain because you have pain receptors in your uterus and you're shedding a uterine lining. <laughs> so there's, yeah, it's part of it. Um, a, a large part of the pain you're feeling, the cramping and whatnot. Here's a fun thing to make you shake your fist at the heavens. Um, so you, you, you can watch, there's a video on my YouTube channel called Menstruation Education where I go into great detail about the different hormones going on here while also electrocuting myself to simulate period cramps. Um, but one of the most important hormones going on here are called prostaglandins um, is, a, is a group of hormones that uh, help you shed this uterine lining by causing the cramping and everything that flushes everything out so your body can flush out the old, old, those old eggs and start cooking up some new ones, which is just a stupid, funny thing to say. You're born with as many eggs you're going to have, but whatever. Um, Prostaglandins also shorten digestion time significantly. So they reduce the amount of time between eating and pooping and cause many people to incur the frightful wrath of what's called period poops, the horrible diarrhea that accompanies the period and makes it just so much worse. So that's why you're feeling so much pain is because of the, 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 the hormones that are they're causing you to cramp out and flush out this, this old uterine lining so that you can uh, reproduce more readily. And the reason for that is because humans are this is the worst way to describe humans. We are continuous breeders. Other animals are seasonal breeders. They have one set time of the, of, of the year that they breed, and then they have, you know, at most, one solid period like that. Um, we have to be constantly ready for babby having. And so we are continuous breeders, so you have regular periods, and it's, it's just awful. It's the worst thing in the world all the time. And I guarantee if cis men had periods we would have massive accommodations for it. We would get time off work. There would be app, their bullshit luxury tax on menstruation on menstrual hygiene products would be nonsense. You would tax them extra as luxury items. How fucking stupid is that? We would have, oh my God, we would have vacation spots. There would be areas you could go into. There would be whole parks dedicated to it. It'd be magical. Sorry, 
Continue on. Oh, this is me. This, Sorry. this is me reading it. I'm continuing on. I'm the asshole in every regard. Um, $10 from Eddie Dean. I'm taking an ethics course. My discussion topic was ethics and atheism. I posted my opinion and got flamed by the Christians. Um, can I call in and ask advice because I have to respond to the posts? Fucking absolutely. You can call into any of these shows. Um, Matt already rattled off which ones are going to be coming up soon. So I hope you're paying attention to that. The only one that I know of is the one I'm on because I'm a self-absorbed little prick. Um, I'll be on on uh, uh, so this Monday, the 13th. So call in then and talk to me about it. But yeah, that's a possibility. You can also call in Sunday. You can call in next Monday, whatever. Or maybe you called in earlier and you just didn't mention this aspect of it, but we appreciate it. Uh, we'll be here. $10 from Shenanigans or Shannon Iggins. Uh, tuning is super late, but here's $10 because I want to hear Forrest talk about the evolutionary behavior of bower birds and birds of paradise and their complex mating rituals. Okay, I, I but not, I, before you do, yeah. we are not allowed to turn <laughs> this into a seven-hour show because I don't want to kill right. the producers and I need to pee and eat. And also, so, and also the tell wings. Us about um, the evolutionary behavior of bower birds and birds of paradise. So this is all sexual selection. I'm not going to give you a satisfying answer because I'm not an ornithologist and I don't have enough stuff on this, but like um, this is all sexual selection. So like when you look at, for example, like a peacock, the big crazy feathers that a male has, um, they get in the way. They definitely don't help avoiding predation. Um, they slow down flight. It's a whole problem. Female peacocks, what we call peahens, um, look like drab, shitty chickens. They're gross, little brown, weird-looking things. Um, they don't have any of these pressures, but uh, this is, you know, uh, interspecific sexual selection or intersexual selection. The males have to compete for the attention of the females, and so the uh, uh, the same thing we see when we see like birds of paradise and bower birds and all these things. They have something about it. Something about having the sticks and blue things and having these complicated dances made those males sexier and they had more mates. And then you have, like we talked about in the beginning with the Baldwin effect, you have the pressure of the ones that are able to do this a little bit better then have more offspring. And of those offspring, the ones that are able to do this a little bit better have more offspring. And so it's just literally, you know, which, which one is sexier, which, you know, with the, 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 if you have, um, intrus sexual selection, um, where it's the males fighting against each other for dominance, and then they get the females. That's one thing. Intersexual selection, going, you know, the 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 males are fighting for the attention of the females. The females get to pick and choose. If you really want to have fun, look up lecking. L e k k i n g. Lecking is something you see in like all sorts of birds and other animals as well, where uh, the males literally just all go out in a field together and they all do their courtship displays all at once, and the females literally just go shopping. They just walk through and they're like, eh, no, nah, I'll take this one. Sure. Come on, Henry. And it's, it's, that's what they do. Great stuff. But yeah. It's all sexual selection, yo. Um, you can learn about that uh, in episode three of the light of evolution on my YouTube channel and probably still not be satisfied with the answer. Cause it's a really complicated topic. <laughs> all right. 999 from Kim uh, Wilson. Thank you, Kim. Oh, fuck. All right. I, get, I, don't, I don't know if it was me or you. Yep. Yeah. It's fine. You uh, go ahead. This is your show. Regarding race, the Hoff twins, white kids who grew up in a black community, they're treated as black, got an inward pass and everything. Interesting case. I don't know anything about it. Yeah. I've never it's, it's, heard it of it. It is them. very much cultural. Very, very uh, much yep. a cultural thing as to who gets passes on what. 1999 from Princess Liz. Thank you, Princess Liz. It's very kind of you. Yes. I got the easy $10 one. from Beck Vagnarelli. I'm trans mask and recently got into a debate about dysphoria and clothing. I'm all for cis men wearing femme clothes, but if forced, I would have dysphoria. I was told clothes have no gender thoughts. Well, um, they don't, yeah, with that. but they do. Yeah, um, it's like, it's like, oh, well, pink is for girls and blue is for boys. Yes, but it used to be the other way. Ah, well, uh, women don't wear pants. Yeah, actually they do, but there were times when they didn't. And so we enforce certain, impose certain um, cultural restrictions on things. And so if somebody says, oh, clothes don't have gender. Yes, they don't it, technically, but they, there is a perceived gender association with certain clothing. Um, a frilly dress and 
uh, Easter bonnet hat tends to be feminine, whether it's you know necessarily tied to a gender or not, it is perceived as feminine normatively, not necessarily universally. Yeah, it's it's uh it is interesting that like when when the phrase clothes have no gender is used, it's usually describing the fact that you can wear whatever you want to wear. And that you don't, you know, just because you choose to paint your fingernails or or dress in something pink or whatever like that doesn't mean that you are necessarily now to be treated as a girl. However, that still doesn't take away the cultural implication of like traditionally women wear these things and now I as a woman would like to as well. You know what I mean? Like that's 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 very different. So like I don't paint my fingernails and I don't wear dresses because it sounds really fiddly and difficult to keep up with and because it seems too floppy and that would drive me insane. That is the only reason I don't do those things. If I thought that painted fingernails looked good enough and I was willing to put in the work for them, I would paint them. If dresses were more comfortable for me, I would wear them. It, it doesn't, just, there's no association there in my mind. Um, but I would also have to grapple with the fact that like, I will now be perceived a different way. That's reasonable. I don't know. It's, it's nuance, yo. It's nuance. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, it's the big not, thing is It's that... not neither one, but it is definitely both. <laughs> The big thing is that you recognize what your boundaries are going to be and what would cause you dysphoria, and nobody should be requiring or expecting you to meet up to their expectations on any of this. Um, so you, you can have those interesting uh, debates whenever you like, but at the end of the day, you need to make sure that you're taking care of you. I guess the best way to say it would be like clothes don't have a gender. They have been like assigned to a gender. Like they, they are not gendered things in themselves. They're fucking clothes or inanimate, but they have been declared associated with a gender. And that's very different than having a literal gendered object. I guess that's the way I would reconcile those two statements. Cause they are, they do sound contradictory when you put them that way for sure, but they're not <laughs> like uh, 999 from 700 bees in the human suit. Horrific. Uh, hey, Forrest, on skin tone and melanin, Northern European peoples developed lighter skin tone. Any thoughts on why Inuit and other na uh, Northern Native tribes didn't? Um, it has to do with a couple of things. One is reflectivity. Um, so, like, you have sunlight coming down and then bouncing up off of the snow. So you actually have a lot more UV exposure than you would have in other places. So you have to account for that. And also the amount of um, uh, vitamin D from diet uh, that comes into play. So like if you're getting significant vitamin D from your diet, from fish or whatever like that, um, you're not going to have need for lighter skin as much as someone who has a more agricultural diet and doesn't get the kind of vitamin D that they would need from that. Um, so yeah, there's a few other reasons that would happen. More often than not, uh, skin coloration distribution uh, pretty perfectly aligns with UV saturation on the surface of the earth. But there are some exceptions to that, and it has more to do with things like climate and elevation and diet than anything else. 999 from Lane Harrison. Thank you, Lane. Forrest, what do you think about GADSAD? Additionally, evolutionary psychology being used as an argument against gender in the trans community as well as its credibility within science. I am nowhere near qualified to comment on any of that. Um, I have yet to hear a lot of good things about the people who use evolutionary psychology as an argument politically. Um, however, I am not a psychologist. So... Just because it has the word evolutionary in it does not mean that it applies to me, unfortunately. And I, I am nowhere near qualified to comment on this. I'm sorry that you spent $10 for me to tell you that. That's all right. I know they asked you, but as I'm the one who had the, um, well, not really back and forth with Gad said the other day, but when I called him out for his transphobic bullshit, he decided to retweet it, mocking me how I used to call out uh, the irrationality of religion. But now I'm talking about how some men have periods because he posted an image of a bunch of trans men um, where it said, people have periods. And he's like, I warned you this was going to happen. And I called him out for saying, what'd you warn us about? The true statements will be made because it is technically true. People have periods. And the only justification right. for remotely objecting to that is that you don't want to consider the people who are having periods should be referred to as anything other than women or female. If you're going to go down the, the dog whistle or, the more dog whistle like route. Um, so rather than engage in any sort of, uh, you know, conversation, he and I, I don't think we've ever actually spoken. Uh, he decided to retweet in a mocking way, which just showed how dishonest he is. I, I'm, I was right literally and 
ethically I was right. I was the one that wasn't sitting there mocking people for their gender uh, and trying to make hay out of something that isn't real. I have never heard of Gad Sad. I didn't know who this person was until you just explained it. But like I, I, uh, I would say honestly, like th- this is the biggest problem. Is like if I when I talk about this, I say like you know people with uteruses, and then I talk about yeah. menstruation, and people freak out and like you mean women? It's like so. Even if you want to completely discredit trans people and just pretend like they don't exist, fine. Not all women have uteruses, and not everyone with a uterus is a woman. There are plenty of epistatic you know, mutations and shit that you can have where you can have XY chromosomes and develop a uterus. It's not, fu- it's like map 2K something like, I don't remember. But like there's, there, there's, there's clearly shit with that. What the fuck is wrong with you that you want to say that all women exclusively only have uteruses, all uteri, all the time? What's the right. point? Even if you don't pretend, that, even if you pretend that trans people don't exist, it's fucking accurate. It's not hard to be accurate and inclusive. It's like, yeah. I love talking about when I, I talk about sex as, as non-binary, like that's a thing that gets a lot. People are like, oh, well, some people are born without an arm. So are you going to say that arms are a spectrum as well? Or can you just say humans have two arms? Like, motherfucker, most people have two arms. Typically, people have two arms. Generally speaking, humans have two arms. Inclusivity and accuracy are not mutually exclusive. <laughs> it's just, just fucking. But, it's like, oh my god! But irrespective, this is how obsessed they are with this topic. That irrespective of whether or not there were any any trans issues at all, the statement "people have periods." There's no grounds on which to object to that. Because That's, that is a very under, true under <laughs> your objection instantly means that you don't consider the individuals who are having periods to be people. Exactly. Oh my God, bro. The, the sexist implication when you come into, like, why is it that the fucking every single time we have to debate trans people, it is always trans women? Because it's the best opportunity to blend homophobia and sexism yep. together, right? Oh, it's why all are homophobia. we never arguing about, are you a real man? Why is that never a topic that we have to discuss? Well, actually, I have had oh, those, those arguments as well, but that's all about toxic masculinity. I'm going to read this one just because it's directed at you. Uh, from oh, sure. uh, Jim Barrows, who was just here Thank and you. got to hang out and play Dominion and everything else. He says, I, for one, welcome our new Valkai overlord, and I'll second that. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. <laughs> I fucking, I'm missing out on all the funds. You're getting wings. Jim's coming over and playing fucking video games and shit. You like, could come over too. I invited you to come check out my breeding experiments and everything. I want to. I'm all the way up here doing research. I just ground up fucking a hundred deer teeth. I have to drive these to Arkansas next week. God damn it. I want to be there playing video games and eating wings. <laughs> Oh, man. James Call sent $10 to ask if burning books contributes to global warming. Yes, it actually literally does, which is yet another reason to not do it. When, when it's a significant contributor, um, then maybe I'll do an episode of the hang up on it. For now, I just hope that there aren't too many people burning too many books anyway. Right. Oh, here's a good uh, question. Ten dollars from Jim Barrow asks: Will the f- uh, show with Forrest and Erica ever end? Tune in to find out. Because, like, all I know is I do have class the next day, and I'm okay with skipping it. So, like, call in and keep us on the line forever. Ten dollars for Solar Cake. Thanks, guys. I love hearing your thoughts and explanations in these discussions. Thank you. I I appreciate Thank being you. appreciated. Uh, Ten dollars from Too Young to Feel This Old. I feel that. Um, I live for Forrest and Erica collabs. Very excited. Great di- uh, job tonight, Matt and Jimmy. Thank you, Thank so, you much. so much. I appreciate that. I will let her know Six- that she's appreciated as well. Sixteen ninety nine and fake money from Canada from Rebus Wind, who, which I appreciate. I know other people. You know, I'm required to say it's fake money, but I appreciate it, Rebus Wind. Really, how I wish I could call in today, but if I'd called in, I would have nothing to talk about. One day I'll find something I disagree with, Matt or Forrest. One day. Well, I hope it never happens, and I hope what ends up what ends up happening is that we find ourselves in the same place at a convention or whatever else, and we're just sitting around side by side, and somebody comes up to ask me a question, and you just answer it with my thoughts, and then I get to sit there and just keep drinking. 
I'll give you something to disagree on in case you don't. Who knows? Uh, my favorite kind of pizza is pineapple and Canadian bacon with cheese stuffed crust. My favorite. Delicious. I, I would eat that. Yeah. Pineapple's great on pizza, especially with stuffy crust, man. It's wonderful. 1069 from Elizabeth Chris. Uh, we are not bothered by watching production stuff. We think it's fun to see Jimmy. Jimmy, get in here. Uh, even if just for a moment, and you can just eat the wings while on the show. Send more chat so this doesn't end. I, I mean, if we had had the way uh, away at the time, and if we talked about it, I'm so busy running the show that he, he could have sent me a message, and I, there's no way in hell I would have seen it. What we could have done is have him show up with the food. I sneak out. Jimmy sits here as me and does... <laughs> the rest of the show and i eat the wings but we're, we're way too late through that we only got a couple of these left um and it's not a big deal i i'm not gonna die of starvation in the short time another just wait a couple another of months, 11 will grow his hair out and get all bubbly and then he'll trace my place as well <laughs> be great yes 11:69 for rebus one i almost tried to call in and just yell don't you remember the name of the show then hang up on you guys but i don't dare to waste those time some more fake dollars for jimmy's tummy outstanding and now, evidently, for my tummy, too, because I got pluckers. Uh, $10 from Eddie Deans. Uh, in my ethics course discussion, I argue that ethics and morals were gained through evolution, not God. Man worked together to thrive before religion was invented. Was I correct to say so? Very, very yes. Um, no. There is a, a all sort What? What? <laughs> Are you just trying to argue? <laughs> no, I, I disagree. I disagree with this notion that this is... So it, it's no more gained through evolution than anything else was, uh, than, you know, my preference for pluckers. Um, the moral foundation, you can't... I would argue that you shouldn't point to evolution as a foundation any more than you should point to God as a foundation. Um, we've learned things. We've learned concepts. And... Um, the best aspects of our morality uh, are come from the things that we understand the best, the more complex things like game theory and things like that, not from evolution. Yes, we evolved and we learned things in that process, but it's not like the mechanics of biological evolution did anything that created ethics and morality within us. That was a product of all of that, just like the car was a product of all of that. I wonder if we're saying the same thing, because the way I would say it is that absolutely we evolved to be moral, because number one, we see a history of, like, we see morality, or what we could argue is morality, things like compassion, empathy, um, justice, fairness, all these things, in lots of other animal species, especially other mammals. So clearly this is something that's, that's you know, a, de a derived trait from that, it's, or sorry, it's an ancestral trait, something that's been along for a long time. Also, we see the more social implications of the word morality in human evolution. So for example, you know, I cover in that, in one of my more recent videos on YouTube about what is a human, I cover like the, the skull from Dominici, which is 1.5, 1.8 million year old skull of Homo erectus that doesn't have any teeth and all the sockets are healed up. So this guy lived for years after all of his teeth fell out. He was a very old man that shows community and compassion and caring and like empathy and all these things that this guy was able to live in a time when he couldn't just bop down to the corner store and get applesauce. Um, cause somebody was making sure that guy had squish, soft, squishy foods and warmth at night and all these things. And we see other things like other species like Neanderthals that have like severe, uh, uh, disabilities and broken bones and things like that and are still living to old ages in their communities. Um, so I would say that there are absolutely, evolutionary uh, implications to what we could call morality or at least ethical behavior. And that now when we take that into a broader social construct or concept, we can now derive these deep meanings from it. And that you might say is more of a social thing than an evolutionary thing. But even then definitely man working together, I should say humans working together well before religion, very yes was a thing. Are we talking past each other or, or are we disagreeing? What do you think? I'm talking about it from a philosophical perspective about where you can find a grounding for morality and you can't find a grounding for morality in biological evolution, just like you can't find a grounding for mathematics and biological evolution, despite the fact that we invented the language of mathematics to, to point to discoveries um, that are actually factual. So mm -hmm. since Eddie didn't spe specify, um, to say morals were gained through evolution is to me, um, trivial because 
Mm. The morals, to say morals were gained through evolution is the same as saying mathematics was gained through evolution. Uh, they're all true and to the same extent, and it's all irrelevant because biological evolution cannot and does not serve as a grounding for moral issues. But that's from a philosophical perspective. We'll have to debate so it another day if that? we are. So would it be fair to say that I'll, I, I can drop this if you want, but I'm, I'm fascinated by this. Would, would it be fair to say then, could we agree on the idea that like these behaviors of course evolved and existed, calling it moral, labeling it, classifying it, yes. categorizing it, yes. those implications are social things. Yes. You can, in, you can discover so, the facts of game theory and you can intuitively get to it on your own. Um, you can figure out that cooperation is better um, strategically um, as a product of just interacting in life, but you can't say, ah, we, from evolution, we then discovered these principles as if the principles are derived from that, but it's a philosophical point. That's yeah, kind yeah, of, yeah. We can Naresh has another for one for you. Time. We should someday. Right, we, yeah. Uh, we, we, you and I will do a seven hour show someday, but not when Jimmy's producing. Cause I don't want to kill him. Right. Right. But that, I'm just saying that alone, we, especially if we get Erica in here, like we could, cause Erica and I've had a long discussion about this as well. Like we, we could do some cool stuff. Um, another hundred dollars from Niresh who says there is no Czechoslovakia anymore. I just don't, I right. see the CZK, man. That's what I go for immediately. Uh, but we still, uh, we and Slovaks have a strong sense of kinship. Um, many love songs here are still about, uh, 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 how connected our nations are and how we can't forget that. That's lovely. That's very, very cool. I am a and thanks so much for heritage. I'm not entirely sure of where. <laughs> thanks so much for doing another super chat. Just to explain that, um, I used to play yeah. a lot of GeoGuessr, and so I ended up in Czech Republic uh, many times. And th there were people who were watching my stream from uh, Slovakia, Slovenia, and others, and, and chiming in. And because uh, I'm an ignorant American that barely knows where I am right now, let alone when I'm playing GeoGuessr, but we had a lot of fun with it. And so it's great to learn yeah, more about the places we should know about, but don't. $10.69 Canadian from Kathleen Moncrief. Would you rather be a bower bird or a terror bird? I pick terror bird, knife feet, and hatchet face all the way. Yeah, 100%. Huh? 100%. Terror birds, yo. They live during the Pleistocene, especially, and they, like, or the coolest ones did anyway, around South America. Like, you know, like ratites. Like, like, like but they're, they're, they're extinct, right? No, they're extinct, yeah. But like, if we had to pick one to be today, terror bird all day long. Freaking look, look up Titanus wallery. Freaking like this massive nine foot tall thing with a skull the size of my torso, just fucking hacking away at creature. Oh, there were wild animals, and humans would have interacted with them too. Like that's the thing. Like when you think about like what ha what was living here on these continents when when people came over here to this side of the planet, fucking Arctodus. The short-faced bear, Titanus Waller is around. Gigantopithecus Blackie was around when humans evolved. The largest great ape that ever lived. Fuck that, dude. Fucking uh, 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 Megatherian, giant ground sloths. The only reason we have avocados today is because of them and then us. Because they, 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 that was their main food source. Avocados, they had those big fucking seeds. Giant ground sloths would eat them bitches and then poop out these massive seeds because giant ground sloths are fucking huge. And then the giant ground sloths died off. But by that time, humans had already been living there and began cultivating avocados because we liked them. And now the, the main reproductive function of the avocado is just humans. They, they, they were the only reason they were they they co-evolved with the sloths and now they're ours and they're beautiful terror birds that's the whole point of this is terror birds look them up they're crazy so, so, so i'm gonna have you read the next one but i want to say this first it's so fun watching you go down a rabbit trail like that because the only reason i was asking is that i was going to make the point that i'd rather be something that isn't extinct so i could possibly find a partner to have sex with but somehow instead you went to avocados. And so here's Bullshit. the next one. Bullshit. As chew sex, eat avocados. That is the point of paleontology. <laughs> um, $20 from Torcus Kurdun. That's wild to say. Um, good thing Aaron wasn't part of the show or else Matt wouldn't have gotten able, been able to get a word in. I think it's hilarious <laughs> yeah, no, that that him. happened right after that <laughs> sidetracked it. Uh, 9.99 from Karina De Leon. 
Forrest, thank you so much for all the education you, education you do. And it's such a great feeling being able to say he's from Oklahoma too. Yes, it is. Matt, you helped me so much. I rewatch your debates too much. Oh, thank you. That's very kind. Thank you so much. I, I, I hope to not be in Oklahoma for long, but while I'm here. Yes, come to Austin. Uh, $10 from Diane Upshaw. I only showed up for cookies and pizza with anchovies. I've Ooh. never had anchovy pizza, but I've always wanted to. I've, I hear it's wild. I hate I'd anchovies. Love to know. I, I only have ever hear like it's terrible. And like sometimes people are like, it's all right. I want to know what the fuss is about. You know what I mean? I don't like fish that smells too fishy. I mean, I love sushi, but if the sushi smells fishy, I can't. I, I just can't. I wish I could. Yeah. Um, but anchovies are one of those things that just instantly smells so raw, fishy that I just don't like. Um, yeah. Yeah, I don't. I, I can't do anchovies. But There's not many things that I wouldn't eat, so like, I'm, I'm willing to try it. I love exploring. Uh, is this when you're you're ten dollars? I, th I think it's mine. Ten dollars from Justin McSmeathy. Uh, two parts. Matt Matt is the correct interpretation of what? Matt is the correct interpretation of Matthew sixteen twenty eight that there is an immoral immortal disciple and still hanging around. If so, for no. what the fuck is this saying? Is the oh I, so, I didn't understand. There's a question. Is the correct interpretation that there is an immortal disciple still hanging around? Question yes. mark. If so, is there a way to find the age of a living animal? Okay. Okay. Uh, you go so first. So no, the first I, part of I would not say that that is remotely. So Matthew 16, 28 is the end of, of that chapter that's where Jesus is basically, truly I tell you there are some standing here today who will not taste death until all of this has come to pass, et cetera. Um, it, because it hasn't necessarily come to pass, there are people who are like, that must mean there's somebody who was there to listen to that speech who's still alive. Uh, I don't think that, that is a reasonable interpretation of it. But within Christendom, there are two different, there's premillennials and postmillennials. There are people who are thinking that this has already come to happen, that it come to pass. There are people who are thinking that we're living in the end times or that we're past the end times, or that because Jesus said this and this and this will happen, that it in fact did happen within a lifetime of somebody else. There is no correct interpretation, which is why there's a bunch of different uh, versions of Christianity. The most reasonable and honest assessment is that Jesus was fucking wrong if he ever said that. Uh, and I would say that there's lots of ways to tell the age of living animals, depending on what animals they are. Um, some animals uh, you can tell by their teeth. Some animals you can tell by wear patterns on different parts of their bodies. Some animals have like grow rings, like a fucking tree type situation going on inside some of their bones. Some animals have different patterns, colorations, whatever, based on different ages of their life. Some animals like, you know, their, their antlers develop further later on in their life. They get you know, more and more points on them. Like, like there's, it depends on the animal as to what you're talking about. Um, as far as the age of a human, uh, it's, a little bit harder to pinpoint exactly how old we are. You just, you just look at the birth certificate. I don't know why it's difficult at all. Yeah, exactly. $10. Yeah, that's, that's what it is. $10 from Fire Chicken 42. I'm a fan of both of you. Please welcome my firstborn son who arrived Monday. Welcome. Greetings. Firstborn human. son of welcome Fire Chicken 42. I, Matt Dillahuddy, and my accomplice, Forrest Valkai, welcome you to this planet, and we hope that we haven't fucked it up for you too much already. Welcome to the party. Everything's terrible here. Uh, 1069 from Kathleen Moncrief uh, says, uh, pineapple, bacon, and banana pepper is the best pizza. 100%. 100%. Banana peppers are where it's at, too. Love them. Ooh. I mean, I would eat pineapple, bacon. I, I don't think I like banana peppers as much. I love um, hotter peppers and pepperoncinis and things like that, but I'm not sure how much I like. Well, what we'll see. I'll, I'll get some banana peppers and see if my taste has changed because my taste on many things uh, has changed over the years. And the final super chat, unless somebody, unless somebody super chats like right now to prove me wrong, $10 from Eddie Dean again, another $10 because I forgot because I got to see of my favorite brains disagree. Oh, I, I think he means that he got to see two of his favorite brains disagree. Thanks for the words shared. You guys rock. Uh, yeah. Look, that's another thing is there are plenty of people in this, uh, in this community 
of atheists, of free thinkers, of secularists, of skeptics, um, who are going to disagree on things. And sometimes it's going to be a, a legitimate, serious disagreement. It's going to be a, a, something era, ethical, something a, about somebody's character. Other times it's going to be about uh, a, a question of fact. Sometimes it's going to be um, a, a, about the best way to go forward and do things. Oh, man, see? See, Rebus Wind, I love it. Uh, not every disagreement has to be the end of the world and you are a terrible, evil person, even if you don't. I hate the phrase. Everybody knows I hate the phrase, agree to disagree. Um, I'll, I will agree that we do disagree. I will not agree that right. there's not a way to a right answer, unless we're talking about something that's just like a matter of opinion. But Rebus Wind, send in more of that Canadian funny money because I've had durian pizza, lychee pizza. My childhood snack was silk moth pupa. You think pineapple Hell will yeah. make me disagree with you, really, Forrest? You're so cute. Dude, there is, like, I, I love, like, there's so many really cool, like, cultural markets around where I live in Tulsa. Like, there's so many cool places to go and visit and explore. And, like, when I grew up, we went to every cultural festival, every religious festival, every, like, you know, cool, like, party and celebration we go to to explore those places. Um, when the Hindu temple opened in Broken Arrow, we were there. When the Buddhist temple opened, we were there. We, like, we wanted to go there and explore these places and try the food and learn the language and learn about the history. And, like, those are the best things in the world. And, like, I freaking love, we have all these, like, uh, uh, there's a Super Mercados Morelos, not too far from where I live. We go get all sorts of, of delicious foods from every Hispanic-speaking country. There's uh, all sorts of Asian markets around. There's Nam Hai. There's a place just called Asian Mart, which is, like, awesome. Um, and you can go get all sorts of different foods across the, uh, East and Southeast Asia. It's wonderful. There's uh, um, these awesome, like, East Indian and, like, uh, 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 Pakistani uh, grocery stores um, over on the other side of town. We can go get, like, all the best freaking, the best garam masalas that I've ever had. Wonderful things. And, like, so many cool places. I love it. So, like, if you have a weird-ass food that you're like, oh, I grew up eating this, like, it may be shocking to me because I've never heard about it before, but guarantee I would love to try it. would love to try it. If you can get me some silk moth pupae, in P.O. Box 1810, Broken Arrow, Oklahoma, 74013. <laughs> Send them my way. I'll check them out, man. I'm all about it. We we should have a P.O. Box set up for the shows because we've already had uh, contests on some of the shows, like Tacus, et cetera, uh, where the loser had to eat this. or the loser, They even got me in for one to, to eat, like, was it peanut butter and, and relish? I think it was, something like that. Um, we could do that if there's some if there's a delicacy in your area that you want to see a, a bunch of dumbass Americans eat just to get the reaction video out in the middle of the show. We could set up a PO box to do that, and uh, for for the right contributions to our our efforts to educate it. people, we will do it. But for us, we'll do it for free. Absolutely, dude. Even like I, I'm I'm uh, so my my whole family is from like Austria, Hungary ukrainian region like that that blump there and so like i grew up eating head cheese and blood and tongue sausage and all sorts of shit that people would find gross today one of my fa literally my favorite comfort food snack that i get all the time is braunschweiger it's liver worst it's 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 ground cav or pig liver ca pate it's like a, a paste like cat food um and you get this this log of it and you slice it off and you put it on a hard roll with some spicy mustard. Best shit in the world, dude. It's amazing. It smells like sh fucking crazy shit to everybody who doesn't like it, but it's awesome and it looks like sin. <laughs> it's bad, but it's so good. It is my favorite thing in the world. Uh, and, and like blood sausage on brown bread with butter. Oh, girl, all about it. All about it. So like, yeah, no, I'll, I'll try anything, man. I want to find a place to get Beilut. It's the duck egg that just hasn't hatched yet, and you eat the whole thing at once. You're just telling me to shut up because you want those wings. Is that what you're just doing? Or are you just telling me this is what Americans eat, you son of a bitch? <laughs> this is I, what I just, I've consume. been sitting here smelling it for, you know, a, a while. Let's let's wrap this up. First of all, huge thank you to Forrest for agreeing, because I, I just reached out to him, like, yesterday or the day before to say, hey, you want to come in and do Wednesday with me? Um, partially because uh, I always love when you're on the show. I like when we get to talk. We don't get to do it as much anymore. But... Tune in for Skeptalk on Monday, where Force and Erica will be talking for hours and hours and educating you on all the coolest things that you could possibly want to know. 
Um, I'm so excited about what all is going on with the Line Network and the people who are involved and how we're building up these different distinct shows that cover a lot of different topics. Um, uh Uh-oh, there's a super chat back, but I don't have... uh, Yes, we do. Huh. Uh, Alex says, how does one become a host on the line? Uh, $10. The best thing that you can do is participate in chat, interact with people, get some volunteer stuff going on, and then express to someone, hey, I think I'd like to give this a try. We don't yet have a mechanism that we've discussed for how we're going to get more people involved in the show. The people that you see showing up on the various shows are all a matter of one of the hosts went out and found someone or was interested in somebody, or we saw uh, a TikTok that they did, we saw a YouTube video they did, and we said, these are the people that we'd love to get on here to talk to. There's not a there's not a vetting process. You don't have to agree with me. You don't have to agree with Forrest. What you have to do yes, is be able do. to be interesting and carry on uh, a conversation, and uh, that's a good chunk of it. But you're on the right track, because we're building a real community here, and I'm gra- glad you got this in here at last minute. Because in addition to thanking uh, Forrest for doing the show today and to Ben for screening and to Dylan and Cookies and everybody else who's out there um, moderating and to Jimmy and Arden who are over in the other room producing, every single person who tunes in and watches these shows and participates in chat without, you know, the ones that aren't trolls, they help build this community. I think we're doing things and I think we're doing them well and we're working to get better at it. You guys make my Wednesdays worth finishing off here. I feel happier and more sane uh, at the end of a Wednesday. I can't, I'm so glad I picked Wednesday. It was first, it was, I don't want to compete with this show or that show or, or anything else. It's like the midweek lift every time I come here with you guys. I'm getting ready to go to a reptile convention this weekend. There's a bunch of stuff going on. Tune in tomorrow for Transatlantic call in Show with Katie and Arden, and they'll tell you about all the other shows that I've already told you about two or three times. On that front, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. We love you all. Please tune in and watch the other shows. Like, subscribe, go over and join on Patreon if that's your bag, because we've already made Jimmy, Jimmy go bald and imitate me. Who knows what we might make people do next. In the meantime, let's all try to be a little kinder and to focus more on the things that are similar about us than what's different so that we don't end up inventing another useless social construct like race. Bye-bye.